Chapter 112 The Blacksmith Availing himself of the mild, summer cool weather that now reigned in these latitudes, and in preparation for the peculiarly active pursuits shortly to be anticipated, Perth, the begrimed, blistered old blacksmith, had not removed his portable forge to the hold again, after concluding his contributory work for Ahab's leg, but still retained it on deck, fast lashed to ring bolts by the foremast, being now almost incessantly invoked by the headsman and harpa oneers and bowsmen to do some little job for them, altering or repairing or new shaping their various weapons and boat furniture. Often he would be surrounded by an eager circle, all waiting to be served, holding boat spades, pike heads, harpoons, and lances, and jealously watching his every sooty movement, as he toiled. Nevertheless, this old man's was a patient hammer wielded by a patient arm. No murmur, no impatience, no petulance did come from him. Silent, slow, and solemn, bowing over still further his chronically broken back, he toiled away, as if toil were life itself, and the heavy beating of his hammer the heavy beating of his heart. And so it was most miserable. A peculiar walk in this old man, a certain slight but painful appearing yawing in his gait, had at an early period of the voyage excited the curiosity of the mariners. And to the importunity of their persisted questionings he had finally given in, and so it came to pass that every one now knew the shameful story of his wretched fate. Belated, and not innocently, one bitter winter's midnight, on the road running between two country towns, the blacksmith half-stupidly felt the deadly numbness stealing over him, and sought refuge in a leaning, dilapidated barn. The issue was, the loss of the extremities of both feet. Out of this revelation, part by part, at last came out the four acts of the gladness, and the one long, and as yet uncatastrophied fifth act of the grief of his life's drama. He was an old man, who, at the age of nearly sixty, had postponedly encountered that thing in sorrow's technicals called ruin. He had been an artisan of famed excellence, and with plenty to do, owned a house and garden, embraced a youthful, daughter-like, loving wife, and three blithe, ruddy children, every Sunday went to a cheerful-looking church, planted in a grove. But one night, under cover of darkness, and further concealed in a most cunning disguisement, a desperate burglar slid into his happy home, and robbed them all of everything. And darker yet to tell, the blacksmith himself did ignorantly conduct this burglar into his family's heart. It was the bottle conjurer. Upon the opening of that fatal cork, forth flew the fiend, and shriveled up his home. Now, for prudent, most wise, and economic reasons, the blacksmith's shop was in the basement of his dwelling, but with a separate entrance to it, so that always had the young and loving healthy wife listened with no unhappy nervousness, but with vigorous pleasure, to the stout ringing of her young armed old husband's hammer, whose reverberations, muffled by passing through the floors and walls, came up to her, not unsweetly, in her nursery, and so, to stout labor's iron lullaby, the blacksmith's infants were rocked to slumber. Oh. Woe on woe! Oh, death, why canst thou not sometimes be timely? Hadst thou taken this old blacksmith to thyself ere his full ruin came upon him, then had the young widow had a delicious grief, and her orphans a truly venerable, legendary sire to dream of in their after years, and all of them a care-killing competency. But death plucked down some virtuous elder brother, on whose whistling daily toil solely hung the responsibilities of some other family, and left the worse than useless old man standing, till the hideous rot of life should make him easier to harvest. Why tell the whole? The blows of the basement hammer every day grew more and more between, and each blow every day grew fainter than the last, the wife sat frozen at the window, with tearless eyes, glitteringly gazing into the weeping faces of her children, the bellows fell, the forge choked up with cinders, the house was sold, 
the mother dived down into the long churchyard grass, her children twice followed her thither, and the houseless, familyless old man staggered off a vagabond in crape, his every woe. Unreverenced, his grey head a scorn to flaxen curls. Death seems the only desirable sequel for a career like this, but death is only a launching into the region of the strange untried, it is but the first salutation to the possibilities of the immense remote, the wild, the watery, the unshored, therefore, to the death-longing eyes of such men, who still have left in them some interior compunctions against suicide, does the all-contributed and all-receptive ocean alluringly spread forth his whole plane of unimaginable, taking terrors, and wonderful, new life adventures, and from the hearts of infinite pacifics, the thousand mermaids sing to them come hither, broken-hearted, here is another life without the guilt of intermediate death, here are wonders supernatural, without dying for them. Come hither. Bury thyself in a life which, to your now equally abhorred and abhorring, landed world, is more oblivious than death. Come hither. Put up thy gravestone, too, within the churchyard, and come hither till we marry thee. Hearkening to these voices, east and west, by early sunrise, and by fall of eve, the blacksmith's soul responded, I, I come. And so Perth went a wailing. Chapter 113 The Forge With matted beard, and swathed in a bristling sharkskin apron, about midday, Perth was standing between his forge and anvil, the latter placed upon an iron wood log, with one hand holding a pike head in the coals, and with the other at his forge's lungs, when Captain Ahab came along, carrying in his hand a small rusty looking leathern bag. While yet a little distance from the forge, Moody Ahab paused, till at last, Perth, withdrawing his iron from the fire, began hammering it upon the anvil the red mass sending off the sparks in thick hovering flights some of which flew close to Ahab. Are these thy mother carries chickens, Perth? They are always flying in thy wake, birds of good omen, too, but not to all, look here, they burn, but thou thou livest among them without a scorch. Because I am scorched all over, Captain Ahab, answered Perth, resting for a moment on his hammer, I am past scorching, not easily can st thou scorch a scar. Well, well, no more. Thy shrunk voice sounds too calmly, sanely woeful to me. In no paradise myself, I am impatient of all misery in others that is not mad. Thou should st go mad, blacksmith, say, why dost thou not go mad? How can st thou endure without being mad? Do the heavens yet hate thee? that thou canst not go mad, what word thou making there? Welding an old pike head, sir, there were seams and dents in it. And canst thou make it all smooth again, blacksmith, after such hard usage as it had? I think so, sir. And I suppose thou canst smooth almost any seams and dents, never mind how hard the metal, blacksmith. I, sir. I think I can, all seems and dents but one. Look ya here, then, cried Ahab, passionately advancing, and leaning with both hands on Perth's shoulders, look ya here here can ya smooth out a seam like this, blacksmith, sweeping one hand across his ribbed brow, if thou could st, blacksmith, glad enough would I lay my head upon thy anvil, and feel thy heaviest hammer between my eyes. Answer. Can st thou smooth this seam? Oh! That is the one, sir. Said I not all seams and dents but one. I, blacksmith, it is the one, I, man, it is unsmoothable, for though thou only see st it here in my flesh, it has worked down into the bone of my skull that is all wrinkles. But, away with child's play, no more gaffs and pikes today. Look ya here, jingling the leathern bag, as if it were full of gold coins. I, too, 
want a harpoon made, one that a thousand yoke of fiends could not part, Perth, something that will stick in a whale like his own fin bone. There's the stuff, flinging the pouch upon the anvil. Look yet, blacksmith, these are the gathered nail stubs of the steel shoes of racing horses. Horseshoe stubs, sir? Why, Captain Ahab, thou hast here, then, the best and stubbornest stuff we blacksmiths ever work. I know it, old man, these stubs will weld together like glue from the melted bones of murderers. Quick! Forge me the harpoon. And forge me first, twelve rods for its shank, then wind and twist and hammer these twelve together like the yarns and strands of a towline. Quick! I'll blow the fire. When at last the twelve rods were made, Ahab tried them, one by one, by spiraling them, with his own hand, round a long, heavy iron bolt. A flaw, rejecting the last one. Work that over again, Perth. This done, Perth was about to begin welding the twelve into one, when Ahab stayed his hand, and said he would weld his own iron. As, then, with regular, gasping hems, he hammered on the anvil, Perth passing to him the glowing rods, one after the other, and the hard-pressed forge shooting up its intense straight flame, the Parsi passed silently, and bowing over his head towards the fire, seemed invoking some curse or some blessing on the toil. But, as Ahab looked up, he slid aside. What's that bunch of lucifers dodging about there for, muttered Stubb, looking on from the forecastle. That Parsi smells fire like a fusee, and smells of it himself, like a hot musket's powder pan. At last the shank, in one complete rod, received its final heat, and as Perth, to temper it, plunged it all hissing into the cask of water nearby, the scalding steam shot up into Ahab's bent face. Would st thou brand me, Perth, wincing for a moment with the pain, have I been but forging my own branding iron, then? Pray God, not that, yet I fear something, Captain Ahab. Is not this harpoon for the white whale? For the white fiend? But now for the barbs, thou must make them thyself, man. Here are my razors the best of steel, here, and make the barbs sharp as the needle sleet of the icy sea. For a moment, the old blacksmith eyed the razors as though he would fain not use them. Take them, man, I have no need for them, for I now neither shave, sup, nor pray till but here to work. Fashioned at last into an arrowy shape, and welded by Perth to the shank, the steel soon pointed the end of the iron, and as the blacksmith was about giving the barbs their final heat, prior to tempering them, he cried to Ahab to place the water cask near. No, no no water for that, I want it of the true death temper. Ahoy, there. Tash Tigo, Queequeg, Dagu. What say yet, pagans? Will ye give me as much blood as will cover this barb, holding it high up? A cluster of dark knots replied, yes. Three punctures were made in the heathen flesh, and the white whale's barbs were then tempered. Ego non baptizo te in nomini patris, said in nomini diaboli, deliriously howled Ahab, as the malignant iron scorchingly devoured the baptismal blood. Now, mustering the spare poles from below, and selecting one of hickory, with the bark still investing it, Ahab fitted the end to the socket of the iron. A coil of new towline was then unwound, and some fathoms of it taken to the windlass, and stretched to a great tension. Pressing his foot upon it, till the rope hummed like a harp string, then eagerly bending over it, and seeing no strandings, Ahab exclaimed, Good! And now for the seizings. At one extremity the rope was unstranded, and the separate spread yarns were all braided and woven round the socket of the harpoon, the pole was then driven hard up into the socket, from the lower end the rope was traced halfway along the pole's length, and firmly secured so, with intertwistings of twine. 
This done, pole, iron, and rope like the three fates remained inseparable, and Ahab moodily stalked away with the weapon, the sound of his ivory leg, and the sound of the hickory pole, both hollowly ringing along every plank. But ere he entered his cabin, light, unnatural, half-bantering, yet most piteous sound was heard. Oh, Pip! Thy wretched laugh, thy idle but unresting eye, all thy strange mummeries not unmeaningly blended with the black tragedy of the melancholy ship, and mocked it. Chapter 114 The Gilder Penetrating further and further into the heart of the Japanese cruising ground, the Pequod was soon all astir in the fishery. Often, in mild, pleasant weather, for 12, 15, 18, and 20 hours on the stretch, they were engaged in the boats, steadily pulling, or sailing, or paddling after the whales, or for an interlude of 60 or 70 minutes calmly awaiting their uprising, though with but small success for their pains. At such times, under an abetted sun, afloat all day upon smooth, slow heaving swells, seated in his boat, light as a birch canoe, and so sociably mixing with the soft waves themselves, that like hearthstone cats they purr against the gunwale, these are the times of dreamy quietude, when beholding the tranquil beauty and brilliancy of the ocean's skin, one forgets the tiger heart that pants beneath it, and would not willingly remember, that this velvet paw but conceals a remorseless fang. These are the times, when in his whaleboat the rover softly feels a certain filial, confident, land-like feeling towards the sea, that he regards it as so much flowery earth, and the distant ship revealing only the tops of her masts, seems struggling forward, not through high rolling waves, but through the tall grass of a rolling prairie, as when the western emigrants' horses only show their erected ears, while their hidden bodies widely wade through the amazing verdure. The long-drawn virgin veils, the mild blue hillsides, as over these there steals the hush, the hum, you almost swear that play-wearied children lie sleeping in these solitudes, in some glad Maytime, when the flowers of the woods are plucked. And all this mixes with your most mystic mood, so that fact and fancy, halfway meeting, interpenetrate, and form one seamless whole. Nor did such soothing scenes, however temporary, fail of at least as temporary an effect on Ahab. But if these secret golden keys did seem to open in him his own secret golden treasuries, yet did his breath upon them prove but tarnishing. Oh, grassy glades! Oh, ever vernal endless landscapes in the soul, in yet though long parched by the dead drought of the earthy life and yet, men yet may roll, like young horses in new morning clover, and for some few fleeting moments, feel the cool dew of the life immortal on them. Would to God these blessed calms would last. But the mingled, mingling threads of life are woven by warp and woof, calms crossed by storms, a storm for every calm. There is no steady unretracing progress in this life, we do not advance through fixed gradations, and at the last one pause through infancy's unconscious spell, boyhood's thoughtless faith, adolescence doubt, the common doom, then skepticism, then disbelief, resting at last in manhood's pondering repose of if. But once gone through, we trace the round again, and our infants, boys, and men, and ifs eternally. Where lies the final harbor, whence we unmoor no more? In what rapt ether sails the world, of which the weariest will never weary? Where is the foundling's father hidden? Our souls are like those orphans whose unwed mothers die in bearing them, the secret of our paternity lies in their grave, and we must there to learn it. And that same day, too, gazing far down from his boat's side into that same golden sea, Starbuck lowly murmured. Loveliness unfathomable, as ever lover saw in his young bride's eye, tell me not of thy teeth-teared sharks, and thy kidnapping cannibal ways. Let faith oust fact, let fancy oust memory, I look deep down and do believe. And stub, fish-like, with sparkling scales, 
leaped up in that same golden light. I am Stubb, and Stubb has his history, but here Stubb takes oaths that he has always been jolly. Chapter 115 The Pequod Meets the Bachelor And jolly enough were the sights and the sounds that came bearing down before the wind, some few weeks after Ahab's harpoon had been welded. It was a Nantucket ship, the Bachelor, which had just wedged in her last cask of oil, and bolted down her bursting hatches, and now, in glad holiday apparel, was joyously, though somewhat vaingloriously, sailing round among the widely separated ships on the ground, previous to pointing her prow for home. The three men at her masthead wore long streamers of narrow red bunting at their hats, from the stern, a whaleboat was suspended, bottom down, and hanging captive from the bowsprit was seen the long lower jaw of the last whale they had slain. Signals, ensigns, and jacks of all colors were flying from her rigging, on every side. Sideways lashed in each of her three basket tops were two barrels of sperm, above which, in her topmast cross trees, you saw slender breakers of the same precious fluid, and nailed to her main truck was a brazen lamp. As was afterwards learned, the bachelor had met with the most surprising success, all the more wonderful, for that while cruising in the same seas numerous other vessels had gone entire months without securing a single fish. Not only had barrels of beef and bread been given away to make room for the far more valuable sperm, but additional supplemental casks had been bartered for, from the ships she had met, and these were stowed along the deck, and in the captain's and officer's staterooms. Even the cabin table itself had been knocked into kindling wood, and the cabin mess dined off the broad head of an oil butt, lashed down to the floor for a centerpiece. In the forecastle, the sailors had actually cocked and pitched their chests, and filled them, it was humorously added, that the cook had clapped a head on his largest boiler, and filled it, that the steward had plugged his spare coffee pot and filled it, that the harpa winners had headed the sockets of their irons and filled them, that indeed everything was filled with sperm, except the captain's pantaloons pockets, and those he reserved to thrust his hands into, in self-complacent testimony of his entire satisfaction. As this glad ship of good luck bore down upon the moody Pequod, the barbarian sound of enormous drums came from her forecastle, and drawing still nearer, a crowd of her men were seen standing round her huge tripods, which, covered with the parchment-like poke or stomach skin of the black fish, gave forth a loud roar to every stroke of the clenched hands of the crew. On the quarter deck, the mates and harpa winners were dancing with the olive-hued girls who had eloped with them from the Polynesian Isles, while suspended in an ornamented boat, firmly secured aloft between the foremast and mainmast, three Long Island Negroes, with glittering fiddle bows of whale ivory, were presiding over the hilarious jig. Meanwhile, others of the ship's company were tumultuously busy at the masonry of the tri-works, from which the huge pots had been removed. You would have almost thought they were pulling down the cursed Bastille, such wild cries they raised, as the now useless brick and mortar were being hurled into the sea. Lord and master over all this scene, the captain stood erect on the ship's elevated quarter deck, so that the whole rejoicing drama was full before him, and seemed merely contrived for his own individual diversion. And Ahab, he too was standing on his quarter deck, shaggy and black, with the stubborn gloom, and as the two ships crossed each other's wakes one all jubilations for things past, the other all forebodings as to things to come their two captains in themselves impersonated the whole striking contrast of the scene. Come aboard, come aboard, cried the gay bachelor's commander, lifting a glass and a bottle in the air. Hast seen the white whale, gritted Ahab in reply. No, only heard of him but don't believe in him at all," said the other good-humouredly. Come aboard. Thou art too damned jolly. Sail on. Hast lost any men? Not enough to speak of two Icelanders, that's all, but come aboard, old hearty, come along. I'll soon take that black from your brow. 
Come along, will ya, marries the play, a full ship and homeward bound. How wondrous familiar is a fool, muttered Ahab, then aloud, Thou art a full ship and homeward bound, thou sest, well, then, call me an empty ship, and outward bound. So go thy ways, and I will mine. Forward there. Set all sail, and keep her to the wind. And thus, while the one ship went cheerily before the breeze, the other stubbornly fought against it, and so the two vessels parted, the crew of the Pequot looking with grave, lingering glances towards the receding bachelor, but the bachelor's men never heeding their gaze for the lively revelry they were in. And as Ahab, leaning over the taffrail, eyed the homeward bound craft, he took from his pocket a small vial of sand, and then looking from the ship to the vial, seemed thereby bringing two remote associations together, for that vial was filled with Nantucket soundings. Chapter 116 The Dying Whale Not seldom in this life, when, on the right side, fortune's favorites sail close by us, we, though all a droop before, catch somewhat of the rushing breeze, and joyfully feel our bagging sails fill out. So seemed it with the Pequod. For next day after encountering the gay bachelor, whales were seen and four were slain, and one of them by Ahab. It was far down the afternoon, and when all the spearings of the crimson fight were done, and floating in the lovely sunset sea and sky, sun and whale both stilly died together, then, such a sweetness and such plaintiveness, such enwreathing orisons curled up in that rosy air, that it almost seemed as if far over from the deep green convent valleys of the Mania Isles, the Spanish land breeze, wantonly turned sailor, had gone to sea, freighted with these vesper hymns. Soothed again, but only soothed to deeper gloom, Ahab, who had sterned off from the whale, sat intently watching his final wanings from the now tranquil boat. For that strange spectacle observable in all sperm whales dying the turning sunwards of the head, and so expiring that strange spectacle, beheld of such a placid evening, somehow to Ahab conveyed a wondrousness unknown before. He turns and turns him to it how slowly, but how steadfastly, his homage rendering and invoking brow, with his last dying motions. He too worships fire, most faithful, broad, baronial vassal of the sun, oh that these two favoring eyes should see these two favoring sights. Look. Here, far water locked beyond all hum of human weal or woe, in these most candid and impartial seas, where to traditions no rocks furnish tablets, where for long Chinese ages, the billows have still rolled on speechless and unspoken to, as stars that shine upon the Niger's unknown source, here, too, life dies sunwards full of faith, but see. No sooner dead, than death whirls round the corpse, and it heads some other way. Oh. Thou dark Hindu half of nature, who of drowned bones hast builded thy separate throne somewhere in the heart of these unverdured seas, thou art an infidel, thou queen, and too truly speakest to me in the wide slaughtering typhoon, and the hushed burial of its after calm. Nor has this thy whale sunwards turned his dying head, and then gone round again, without a lesson to me. O oh, trebly hooped and welded hip of power! O! Oh, High aspiring, rainbow jet, that one strivest, this one jettest all in vain. In vain, O whale, dost thou seek intercedings with yon all quickening sun, that only calls forth life, but gives it not again. Yet dost thou, darker half, rock me with a prouder, if a darker faith. All thy unnameable imminglings float beneath me here, I am buoyed by breaths of once living things exhaled as air, but water now. Then hail, forever hail, O sea, in whose eternal tossings the wild fowl finds his only rest. Born of earth, yet suckled by the sea, though hill and valley mothered me, ye billows are my foster brothers. Chapter 117 The Whale Watch The four whales slain that evening had died wide apart, 
1. Far to windward, 1. Less distant, to leeward, 1 ahead, 1 astern. These last three were brought alongside ere nightfall, but the windward one could not be reached till morning, and the boat that had killed it lay by its side all night, and that boat was Ahab's. The wave pole was thrust upright into the dead whale's spout hole, and the lantern hanging from its top, cast a troubled flickering glare upon the black, glossy back, and far out upon the midnight waves, which gently chafed the whale's broad flank, like soft surf upon a beach. Ahab and all his boat's crew seemed asleep but the Parsi, who crouching in the bow, sat watching the sharks, that spectrally played round the whale, and tapped the light cedar planks with their tails. A sound like the moaning in squadrons over asphaltites of unforgiven ghosts of Gamara, ran shuddering through the air. Started from his slumbers, Ahab, face to face, saw the Parsi, and hooped round by the gloom of the night they seemed the last men in a flooded world. I have dreamed it again, said he. Of the hearses. Have I not said, old man, that neither hearse nor coffin can be thine? And who are hearse that die on the sea? But I said, old man, that ere thou couldst die on this voyage, two hearses must verily be seen by thee on the sea, the first not made by mortal hands, and the visible wood of the last one must be grown in America. I, I. A strange sight that, Parsi a hearse and its plumes floating over the ocean with the waves for the pallbearers. Ha! Such a sight we shall not soon see. Believe it or not, thou canst not die till it be seen, old man. And what was that saying about thyself? Though it come to the last, I shall still go before thee thy pilot. And when thou art so gone before if that ever befall then ere I can follow, thou must still appear to me, to pilot me still, was it not so? Well, then, did I believe all ye say, O oh my pilot? I have here two pledges that I shall yet slay Moby Dick and survive it. Take another pledge, old man, said the Parsi as his eyes lighted up like fireflies in the gloom hemp only can kill thee. The gallows, ye mean I am immortal then, on land and on sea, cried Ahab, with a laugh of derision, immortal on land and on sea. Both were silent again, as one man. The grey dawn came on, and the slumbering crew arose from the boat's bottom, and ere noon the dead whale was brought to the ship. Chapter 118 The Quadrant The season for the line at length drew near, and every day when Ahab, coming from his cabin, cast his eyes aloft, the vigilant helmsman would ostentatiously handle his spokes, and the eager mariners quickly run to the braces, and would stand there with all their eyes centrally fixed on the nailed doubloon, impatient for the order to point the ship's prow for the equator. In good time the order came. It was hard upon high noon, and Ahab, seated in the bows of his high-hoisted boat, was about taking his wanted daily observation of the sun to determine his latitude. Now, in that Japanese sea, the days in summer are as freshets of effulgences. That unblinkingly vivid Japanese sun seems the blazing focus of the glassy ocean's immeasurable burning glass. The sky looks lacquered clouds there are none, the horizon floats, and this nakedness of unrelieved radiance is as the insufferable splendors of God's throne. Well that Ahab's quadrant was furnished with colored glasses, through which to take sight of that solar fire. So, swinging his seated form to the roll of the ship, and with his astrological looking instrument placed to his eye, he remained in that posture for some moments to catch the precise instant when the sun should gain its precise meridian. Meantime while his whole attention was absorbed, the Parsi was kneeling beneath him on the ship's deck, and with face thrown up like Ahab's, was eyeing the same sun with him, only the lids of his eyes half hooded their orbs, and his wild face was subdued to an earthly passionlessness. At length the desired observation was taken, and with his pencil upon his ivory leg, Ahab soon calculated what his latitude must be at that precise instant. 
Then falling into a moment's reverie, he again looked up towards the sun and murmured to himself, Thou see Mark! Thou high and mighty pilot! Thou tellest me truly where I am but canst thou cast the least hint where I shall be? Or canst thou tell where some other thing besides me is this moment living? Where is Moby Dick? This instant thou must be eyeing him. These eyes of mine look into the very eye that is even now beholding him, I, and into the eye that is even now equally beholding the objects on the unknown, thither side of thee, thou son. Then gazing at his quadrant, and handling, one after the other, its numerous cabalistical contrivances, he pondered again, and muttered, foolish toy. Baby's plaything of haughty admirals and commodores and captains, the world brags of thee, of thy cunning and might, but what after all canst thou do, but tell the poor, pitiful point, where thou thyself happenest to be on this wide planet, and the hand that holds thee, no. Not one jot more. Thou canst not tell where one drop of water or one grain of sand will be tomorrow noon, and yet with thy impotence thou insultest the sun. Science. Curse thee, thou vain toy, and cursed be all the things that cast man's eyes aloft to that heaven, whose live vividness but scorches him, as these old eyes are even now scorched with thy light, O sun. Level by nature to this earth's horizon are the glances of man's eyes, not shot from the crown of his head, as if God had meant him to gaze on his firmament. Curse thee, thou quadrant, dashing it to the deck, no longer will I guide my earthly way by thee, the level ship's compass, and the level dead reckoning, by log and by line, these shall conduct me, and show me my place on the sea. I, lighting from the boat to the deck, thus I trample on thee, thou paltry thing that feebly pointest on high, thus I split and destroy thee. As the frantic old man thus spoke and thus trampled with his live and dead feet, a sneering triumph that seemed meant for Ahab, and a fatalistic despair that seemed meant for himself these passed over the mute, motionless Parsi's face. Unobserved he rose and glided away, while, awestruck by the aspect of their commander, the seamen clustered together on the forecastle, till Ahab, troubledly pacing the deck, shouted out to the braces. Up helm, square in. In an instant the yards swung round, and as the ship half-wheeled upon her heel, her three firm-seated graceful masts erectly poised upon her long, ribbed hull, seemed as the three haretai pirouetting on one sufficient steed. Standing between the night heads, Starbuck watched the Pequod's tumultuous way, and Ahab's also, as he went lurching along the deck. I have sat before the dense coal fire and watched it all aglow, full of its tormented flaming life, and I have seen it wane at last, down, down, to dumbest dust. Old man of oceans! Of all this fiery life of thine, what will at length remain but one little heap of ashes? I, cried Stubb, but see coal ashes mind ye that, Mr. Starbuck see coal, not your common charcoal. Well, well, I heard Ahab mutter, here someone thrusts these cards into these old hands of mine, swears that I must play them, and no others. And damn me, Ahab, but thou actest right, live in the game, and die in it. Chapter 119 The Candles Warmest climbs but nurse the cruelest fangs, the tiger of Bengal crouches in spiced groves of ceaseless verdure. Skies the most effulgent but basket the deadliest thunders, gorgeous Cuba knows tornadoes that never swept tame northern lands. So, too, it is, that in these resplendent Japanese seas the mariner encounters the direst of all storms, the typhoon. It will sometimes burst from out that cloudless sky, like an exploding bomb upon a dazed and sleepy town. Towards evening of that day, the Pequod was torn of her canvas, and Bear Pold was left to fight a typhoon which had struck her directly ahead. When darkness came on, sky and sea roared and split with the thunder, and blazed with the lightning, 
that showed the disabled masts fluttering here and there with the rags which the first fury of the tempest had left for its after sport. Holding by a shroud, Starbuck was standing on the quarter deck, at every flash of the lightning glancing aloft, to see what additional disaster might have befallen the intricate hamper there, while Stubb and Flask were directing the men in the higher hoisting and firmer lashing of the boats. But all their pains seemed not. Though lifted to the very top of the cranes, the windward quarter boat, Ahab's, did not escape. A great rolling sea, dashing high up against the reeling ship's high teetering side, stove in the boat's bottom at the stern, and left it again, all dripping through like a sieve. Bad work, bad work. Mr. Starbuck, said Stubb, regarding the wreck, but the sea will have its way. Stubb, for one, can't fight it. You see, Mr. Starbuck, a wave has such a great long start before it leaps, all round the world it runs, and then comes the spring. But as for me, all the start I have to meet it, is just across the deck here. But never mind, it's all in fun, so the old song says, sings. Oh! Jolly is the gale, and a joker is the whale. A flourish in his tail. Such a funny, sporty, gamey, jesty, jokey, hokey pokey lad, is the ocean, oh. The scud all a flyin'. That's his flip only foamin'. When he stirs in the spicin'. Such a funny, sporty, gamey, jesty, jokey, hokey pokey lad, is the ocean, oh. Thunder splits the ships. But he only smacks his lips. A tastin' of this flip. Such a funny, sporty, gamey, jesty, jokey, hokey pokey lad, is the ocean, oh. A vast stub, cried Starbuck, let the typhoon sing, and strike his harp here in our rigging, but if thou art a brave man thou wilt hold thy peace. But I am not a brave man, never said I was a brave man. I am a coward, and I sing to keep up my spirits. And I tell you what it is, Mr. Starbuck, there's no way to stop my singing in this world but to cut my throat. And when that's done, ten to one I sing ye the doxology for a wind up. Madman, look through my eyes if thou hast none of thine own. What, how can you see better of a dark night than anybody else, never mind how foolish. Here cried Starbuck, seizing Stubb by the shoulder, and pointing his hand towards the weather bow, markest thou not that the gale comes from the eastward, the very course Ahab is to run for Moby Dick, the very course he swung to this day noon, now mark his boat there, where is that stove? In the stern sheets, man, where he is wont to stand his standpoint is stove, man. Now jump overboard, and sing away, if thou must. I don't half understand yet, what's in the wind. Yes, yes, round the Cape of Good Hope is the shortest way to Nantucket, soliloquized Starbuck suddenly, heedless of Stubbs' question. The gale that now hammers at us to stave us, we can turn it into a fair wind that will drive us towards home. Yonder, to windward, all is blackness of doom, but to leeward, Homeward I see it lightens up there, but not with the lightning. At that moment in one of the intervals of profound darkness, following the flashes, a voice was heard at his side, and almost at the same instant a volley of thunder peals rolled overhead. Who's there? Old Thunder, said Ahab, groping his way along the bulwarks to his pivot hole, but suddenly finding his path made plain to him by elbowed lances of fire. Now, as the lightning rod to aspire on shore is intended to carry off the perilous fluid into the soil, so the kindred rod which at sea some ships carry to each mast, is intended to conduct it into the water. But as this conductor must descend to considerable depth, that its end may avoid all contact with the hull, and as moreover, if kept constantly towing there, it would be liable to many mishaps, besides interfering not a little with some of the rigging, 
and more or less impeding the vessel's way in the water, because of all this, the lower parts of a ship's lightning rods are not always overboard, but are generally made in long slender links, so as to be the more readily hauled up into the chains outside, or thrown down into the sea, as occasion may require. The rods, the rods, cried Starbuck to the crew, suddenly admonished to vigilance by the vivid lightning that had just been darting flambeaux, to light Ahab to his post. Are they overboard? Drop them over, fore and aft. Quick! Avast! cried Ahab, let's have fair play here, though we be the weaker side. Yet I'll contribute to raise rods on the Himalayas and Andes, that all the world may be secured, but out on privileges. Let them be, sir. Look aloft, cried Starbuck. The corpus ants, the corpus ants. All the yardarms were tipped with a pallid fire, and touched at each tri-pointed lightning rod and with three tapering white flames, each of the three tall masts was silently burning in that sulfurous air like three gigantic wax tapers before an altar. Blast the boat, let it go, cried Stubb at this instant, as a swashing sea heaved up under his own little craft, so that its gunwale violently jammed his hand, as he was passing a lashing. Blast it! But slipping backward on the deck, his uplifted eyes caught the flames, and immediately shifting his tone he cried the corpus ants have mercy on us all. To sailors, oaths are household words, they will swear in the trance of the calm, and in the teeth of the tempest, they will imprecate curses from the topsail yard arms, when most they teeter over to a seething sea, but in all my voyagings, seldom have I heard a common oath when God's burning finger has been laid on the ship, when his many, many, tekel up harson has been woven into the shrouds and the cordage. While this pallidness was burning aloft, Few words were heard from the enchanted crew, who in one thick cluster stood on the forecastle, all their eyes gleaming in that pale phosphorescence, like a far away constellation of stars. Relieved against the ghostly light, the gigantic jet negro, Dagu, loomed up to thrice his real stature, and seemed the black cloud from which the thunder had come. The parted mouth of Tash Tigo revealed his shark white teeth which strangely gleamed as if they too had been tipped by corpus ants, while lit up by the preternatural light, Queequeg's tattooing burned like satanic blue flames on his body. The tableau all waned at last with the pallidness aloft, and once more the Pequod and every soul on her decks were wrapped in a pall. A moment or two passed, when Starbuck, going forward, pushed against someone. It was Stubb. What thinkest thou now? Man, I heard thy cry, it was not the same in the song. No, no, it wasn't, I said the corpus ants have mercy on us all, and I hope they will, still. But do they only have mercy on long faces, have they no bowels for a laugh? And look yet, Mr. Starbuck but it's too dark to look. Hear me, then, I take that masthead flame we saw for a sign of good luck for those masts are rooted in a hold that is going to be chock a block with sperm oil, do you see, and so, all that sperm will work up into the masts, like sap in a tree. Yes, our three masts will yet be as three spermaceti candles that's the good promise we saw. At that moment Starbuck caught sight of Stubb's face slowly beginning to glimmer into sight. Glancing upwards, he cried, see, see and once more the high tapering flames were beheld with what seemed redoubled supernaturalness in their pallor. The corpus ants have mercy on us all, cried Stubb, again. At the base of the mainmast, full beneath the doubloon and the flame, the Parsi was kneeling in Ahab's front, but with his head bowed away from him, while nearby, from the arched and overhanging rigging, where they had just been engaged securing a spar, a number of the seamen, arrested by the glare, now cohered together, and hung pendulous, like a knot of numbed wasps from a drooping, orchard twig. In various enchanted attitudes, like the standing, or stepping, or running skeletons in Herculaneum, 
others remained rooted to the deck, but all their eyes upcast. I, I, men, cried Ahab. Look up at it, mark it well, the white flame but lights the way to the white whale. Hand me those mainmast links there, I would fain feel this pulse, and let mine beat against it, blood against fire. So. Then turning the last link held fast in his left hand, he put his foot upon the Parsi, and with fixed upward eye, and high-flung right arm, he stood erect before the lofty tri-pointed trinity of flames. Oh, thou clear spirit of clear fire, whom on these seas I as Persian once did worship, till in the sacramental act so burned by thee, that to this hour I bear the scar, I now know thee, thou clear spirit, and I now know that thy right worship is defiance. To neither love nor reverence wilt thou be kind, and e'en for hate thou canst but kill, and all are killed. No fearless fool now fronts thee. I own thy speechless, placeless power, but to the last gasp of my earthquake life will dispute its unconditional, unintegral mastery in me. In the midst of the personified impersonal, a personality stands here. Though but a point at best, whence so ye are I came, where so ye are. I go, yet while I earthly live, the queenly personality lives in me, and feels her royal rights. But war is pain, and hate is woe. Come in thy lowest form of love, and I will kneel and kiss thee, but at thy highest, come as mere supernal power, and though thou launchest navies of full freighted worlds, there's that in here that still remains indifferent. Oh, thou clear spirit, of thy fire thou madest me, and like a true child of fire, I breathe it back to thee. Sudden, repeated flashes of lightning, the nine flames leap lengthwise to thrice their previous height, Ahab, with the rest, closes his eyes, his right hand pressed hard upon them. I own thy speechless, placeless power, said I not so? Nor was it wrung from me, nor do I now drop these links. Thou canst blind, but I can then grope. Thou canst consume, but I can then be ashes. Take the homage of these poor eyes, and shut her hands. I would not take it. The lightning flashes through my skull, mine eyeballs ache and ache, my whole beaten brain seems as beheaded and rolling on some stunning ground. Oh, oh! Yet blindfold, yet will I talk to thee. Light though thou be, thou leapest out of darkness, but I am darkness leaping out of light, leaping out of thee. The javelins cease, open eyes, see, or not. There burn the flames. Oh, thou magnanimous! Now I do glory in my genealogy, but thou art but my fiery father, my sweet mother, I know not. Oh, cruel! What hast thou done with her? There lies my puzzle, but thine is greater. Thou knowest not how came yet, hence callayest thyself unbegotten, certainly knowest not thy beginning, hence callayest thyself unbegun. I know that of me, which thou knowest not of thyself, O, oh, thou omnipotent! There is some unsuffusing thing beyond thee, thou clear spirit, to whom all thy eternity is but time, all thy creativeness mechanical. Through thee, thy flaming self, my scorched eyes do dimly see it. O, oh, thou foundling fire, thou hermit immemorial, thou too hast thy incommunicable riddle, thy unparticipated grief. Here again with haughty agony, I read my sire. Leave. Leap up, and lick the sky. I leap with thee, I burn with thee, would fain be welded with thee, defyingly I worship thee. The boat, the boat, cried Starbuck, look at thy boat, old man. Ahab's harpoon, the one forged at Perth's fire, remained firmly lashed in its conspicuous crotch, so that it projected beyond his whaleboat's bow but the sea that had stove its bottom had caused the loose leather sheath to drop off, and from the keen steel barb there now came a leveled flame of pale, forked fire. 
As the silent harpoon burned there like a serpent's tongue, Starbuck grasped Ahab by the arm God, God is against thee, old man, forbear, tis an ill voyage. Ill begun, ill continued, let me square the yards, while we may, old man, and make a fair wind of it homewards, to go on a better voyage than this. Overhearing Starbuck, the panic-stricken crew instantly ran to the braces though not a sail was left aloft. For the moment all the aghast mate's thoughts seemed theirs, they raised a half-mutinous cry. But dashing the rattling lightning links to the deck, and snatching the burning harpoon, Ahab waved it like a torch among them, swearing to transfix with it the first sailor that but cast loose a rope's end. Petrified by his aspect, and still more shrinking from the fiery dart that he held, the men fell back in dismay, and Ahab again spoke. All your oaths to hunt the white whale are as binding as mine, and heart, soul, and body, lungs and life, old Ahab is bound. And that ye may know to what tune this heart beats, look ye here, thus I blow out the last fear. And with one blast of his breath he extinguished the flame. As in the hurricane that sweeps the plain, men fly the neighborhood of some lone, gigantic elm, whose very height and strength but render it so much the more unsafe, because so much the more a mark for thunderbolts, so at those last words of Ahab's many of the mariners did run from him in a terror of dismay. Chapter 120 The Deck Towards the End of the First Night Watch Ahab Standing by the Helm Starbuck approaching him. We must send down the main topsail yard, sir. The band is working loose and the lee lift is half stranded. Shall I strike it, sir? Strike nothing, lash it. If I had sky sail poles, I'd sway them up now. Sir, in God's name, sir. Well, the anchors are working, sir. Shall I get them inboard? Strike nothing, and stir nothing, but lash everything. The wind rises, but it has not got up to my table lands yet. Quick, and see to it by masts and keels. He takes me for the hunchbacked skipper of some coasting smack. Sent down my main topsail yard. Ho, glue pots. Loftiest trucks were made for wildest wines and this brain truck of mine now sails amid the cloud scud. Shall I strike that? Oh, none but cowards sent down their brain trucks in tempest time. What a horoosh aloft there! I would e'en take it for sublime, did I not know that the colic is a noisy malady. Oh, take medicine, take medicine. Chapter 121 Midnight the Folksal Bulwarks Stub and flask mounted on them, and passing additional lashings over the anchors there hanging. No, Stub, you may pound that knot there as much as you please, but you will never pound into me what you were just now saying. And how long ago is it since you said the very contrary? Didn't you once say that whatever ship Ahab sails in, that ship should pay something extra on its insurance policy? just as though it were loaded with powder barrels aft and boxes of lucifers forward? Stop, now, didn't you say so? Well, suppose I did? What then? I've part changed my flesh since that time, why not my mind? Besides, supposing we are loaded with powder barrels aft and lucifers forward, how the devil could the lucifers get a fire in this drenching spray here? Why? My little man, you have pretty red hair, but you couldn't get a fire now. Shake yourself, your Aquarius, or the water bearer, flask, might fill pitchers at your coat collar. Don't you see, then, that for these extra risks the marine insurance companies have extra guarantees? Here are hydrants, flask. But hark, again, and I'll answer ye the other thing. First take your leg off from the crown of the anchor here, though, so I can pass the rope, now listen. 
What's the mighty difference between holding a mast's lightning rod in the storm, and standing close by a mast that hasn't got any lightning rod at all in a storm? Don't you see, you timberhead, that no harm can come to the holder of the rod, unless the mast is first struck? What are you talking about, then? Not one ship in a hundred carries rods, and eh have I, man, and all of us were in no more danger then, in my poor opinion, than all the crews in ten thousand ships now sailing the seas. Why, you king post, you, I suppose you would have every man in the world go about with a small lightning rod running up the corner of his hat, like a militia officer's skewered feather, and trailing behind like his sash. Why don't ye be sensible, Flask? It's easy to be sensible, why don't ye, then? Any man with half an eye can be sensible. I don't know that, Stub. You sometimes find it rather hard. Yes, when a fellow's soaked through, it's hard to be sensible, that's a fact. And I am about drenched with this spray. Never mind, catch the turn there, and pass it. Seems to me we are lashing down these anchors now as if they were never going to be used again. Tying these two anchors here, flask, seems like tying a man's hands behind him. And what big generous hands they are, to be sure. These are your iron fists, hey? What a hold they have, too. I wonder, flask, whether the world is anchored anywhere, if she is, she swings with an uncommon long cable, though. There, hammer that knot down, and we've done. So, next to touching land, lighting on deck is the most satisfactory. I say, just wring out my jacket skirts, will ya? Thank ya. They laugh at long talks so, flask, but seems to me, a long-tailed coat ought always to be worn in all storms afloat. The tails tapering down that way, serve to carry off the water, do ye see? Same with cocked hats, the cocks form gable and eave troughs, flask. No more monkey jackets and tarpaulins for me, I must mount a swallow tail, and drive down a beaver, so. Hello. Whew. There goes my tarpaulin overboard, lord, lord, that the wines that come from heaven should be so unmannerly. This is a nasty night, lad. Chapter 122 Midnight aloft thunder and lightning The main topsail yard tash Tigo passing new lashings around it. Um, um, um. Stop that thunder. Plenty too much thunder up here. What's the use of thunder? Um, um, um. We don't want thunder, we want rum, give us a glass of rum. Um, um, um. Chapter 123 The Musket During the most violent shocks of the typhoon, the man at the Pequod's jawbone tiller had several times been reelingly hurled to the deck by its spasmodic motions, even though preventer tackles had been attached to it for they were slack because some play to the tiller was indispensable. In a severe gale like this, while the ship is but a tossed shuttlecock to the blast, it is by no means uncommon to see the needles in the compasses, at intervals, go round and round. It was thus with the Pequods, at almost every shock the helmsman had not failed to notice the whirling velocity with which they revolved upon the carts, it is a sight that hardly anyone can behold without some sort of unwanted emotion. Some hours after midnight, the typhoon abetted so much, that through the strenuous exertions of Starbuck and Stubb one engaged forward and the other aft the shivered remnants of the jib and fore and main topsails were cut adrift from the spars, and went eddying away to leeward, like the feathers of an albatross, which sometimes are cast to the winds when that storm-tossed bird is on the wing. The three corresponding new sails were now bent and reefed, and a storm trysail was set further aft, so that the ship soon went through the water with some precision again, and the course for the present, east-southeast which he was to steer, if practicable, was once more given to the helmsman. 
for during the violence of the gale, he had only steered according to its vicissitudes. But as he was now bringing the ship as near her course as possible, watching the compass meanwhile, lo! A good sign. The wind seemed coming round astern, I, the foul breeze became fair. Instantly the yards were squared, to the lively song of Ho! The fair wind! Oh ye ho, cheerly men, the crew singing for joy, that so promising an event should so soon have falsified the evil portents preceding it. In compliance with the standing order of his commander to report immediately, and at any one of the twenty-four hours, any decided change in the affairs of the deck Starbuck had no sooner trimmed the yards to the breeze however reluctantly and gloomily than he mechanically went below to apprise Captain Ahab of the circumstance. Ere knocking at his stateroom, he involuntarily paused before it a moment. The cabin lamp taking long swings this way and that was burning fitfully, and casting fitful shadows upon the old man's bolted door a thin one, with fixed blinds inserted, in place of upper panels. The isolated subterraneousness of the cabin made a certain humming silence to reign there, though it was hooped round by all the roar of the elements. The loaded muskets in the rack were shiningly revealed, as they stood upright against the forward bulkhead. Starbuck was an honest, upright man, but out of Starbuck's heart, at that instant when he saw the muskets, there strangely evolved an evil thought, but so blent with its neutral or good accompaniments that for the instant he hardly knew it for itself. He would have shot me once, he murmured, yes, there's the very musket that he pointed at me, that one with the studded stock, let me touch it lift it. Strange, that I, who have handled so many deadly lances, strange, that I should shake so now. Loaded? I must see. I, I, and powder in the pan, that's not good. Best spill it, wait. I'll cure myself of this. I'll hold the musket boldly while I think I come to report a fair wind to him. But how fair? Fair for death and doom that's fair for Moby Dick. It's a fair wind that's only fair for that accursed fish the very tube he pointed at me, the very one, this one I hold it here, he would have killed me with the very thing I handle now I and he would fain kill all his crew. Does he not say he will not strike his spars to any gale? Has he not dashed his heavenly quadrant? And in these same perilous seas, gropes he not his way by mere dead reckoning of the air abounding log? And in this very typhoon, did he not swear that he would have no lightning rods? But shall this crazed old man be tamely suffered to drag a whole ship's company down to doom with him, yes, it would make him the willful murderer of thirty men and more, if this ship come to any deadly harm, and come to deadly harm, my soul swears this ship will, if Ahab have his way. If, then, he were this instant put aside, that crime would not be his. Ha! Is he muttering in his sleep? Yes, just there and there, he's sleeping. Sleeping? I, but still alive, and soon awake again. I can't withstand thee, then, old man. Not reasoning, not remonstrance, not entreaty wilt thou hearken to, all this thou scornest. Flat obedience to thy own flat commands, this is all thou breathest. I, and say st the men have vowed thee thy vow, say st all of us are Ahabs. Great God forbid, but is there no other way? No lawful way, make him a prisoner to be taken home? What? Hope to wrest this old man's living power from his own living hands? Only a fool would try it. Say he were pinioned even, knotted all over with ropes and hawsers, chained down to ring bolts on this cabin floor, he would be more hideous than a caged tiger, then. I could not endure the sight, could not possibly fly his howlings, all comfort, sleep itself, inestimable reason would leave me on the long intolerable voyage. What, then, remains? The land is hundreds of leagues away, and locked Japan the nearest. I stand alone here upon an open sea, 
with two oceans and a whole continent between me and La I, I, tis so is heaven a murderer when its lightning strikes a would-be murderer in his bed, tindering sheets and skin together, and would I be a murderer, then, if and slowly, stealthily, and half sideways looking, he placed the loaded musket's end against the door. On this level, Ahab's hammock swings within, his head this way. A touch, and Starbuck may survive to hug his wife and child again oh Mary. Mary, boy, 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 but if I wake thee not to death, old man, who can tell to what unsound deep Starbuck's body this day week may sink, with all the crew? Great God, where art thou? Shall I? Shall I? The wind has gone down and shifted, sir, the fore and main topsails are reefed and set, she heads her course. Stern all. O oh, Moby Dick, I clutch thy heart at last. Such were the sounds that now came hurtling from out the old man's tormented sleep, as if Starbuck's voice had caused the long dumb dream to speak. The yet leveled musket shook like a drunkard's arm against the panel, Starbuck seemed wrestling with an angel, but turning from the door, he placed the death tube in its rack, and left the place. He's too sound asleep, Mr. Stubb, go thou down, and wake him, and tell him. I must see to the deck here. Thou knowest he what to say. Chapter 124 The Needle Next morning the not yet subsided sea rolled in long slow billows of mighty bulk, and striving in the Pequod's gurgling track, pushed her on like giant's palms outspread. The strong, unstagering breeze abounded so, that sky and air seemed vast outbellying sails, the whole world boomed before the wind. Muffled in the full morning light, the invisible sun was only known by the spread intensity of his place, where his bayonet rays moved on in stacks. Emblazonings, as of crowned Babylonian kings and queens, reigned over everything. The sea was as a crucible of molten gold, that bubblingly leaps with light and heat. Long maintaining an enchanted silence, Ahab stood apart, and every time the tethering ship loweringly pitched down her bowsprit, he turned to eye the bright sun's rays produced ahead, and when she profoundly settled by the stern, he turned behind, and saw the sun's rearward place, and how the same yellow rays were blending with his undeviating wake. Ha, ha, my ship! Thou mightest well be taken now for the sea chariot of the sun. Ho, ho! All ye nations before my prow, I bring the sun to ye. Yoke on the further billows, hello. A tandem, I drive the sea. But suddenly reined back by some counter thought, he hurried towards the helm, huskily demanding how the ship was heading. East su east, sir, said the frightened steersman. Thou least, smiting him with his clenched fist. Heading east at this hour in the morning, and the sun astern. Upon this every soul was confounded, for the phenomenon just then observed by Ahab had unaccountably escaped everyone else, but its very blinding palpableness must have been the cause. Thrusting his head halfway into the binnacle, Ahab caught one glimpse of the compasses, his uplifted arm slowly fell, for a moment he almost seemed to stagger. Standing behind him Starbuck looked, and lo! The two compasses pointed east, and the Pequod was as infallibly going west. But ere the first wild alarm could get out abroad among the crew, the old man with a rigid laugh exclaimed, I have it. It has happened before. Mr. Starbuck, last night's thunder turned our compasses that's all. Thou hast before now heard of such a thing, I take it. I, but never before has it happened to me, sir, said the pale mate, gloomily. Here, it must needs be said, that accidents like this have in more than one case occurred to ships in violent storms. The magnetic energy, as developed in the mariner's needle, is, as all know, essentially one with the electricity beheld in heaven, hence it is not to be much marveled at, that such things should be. 
instances where the lightning has actually struck the vessel, so as to smite down some of the spars and rigging, the effect upon the needle has at times been still more fatal, all its lodestone virtue being annihilated, so that the before magnetic steel was of no more use than an old wife's knitting needle. But in either case, the needle never again, of itself, recovers the original virtue thus marred or lost, and if the binnacle compasses be affected, the same fate reaches all the others that may be in the ship, even were the lowermost one inserted into the kelson. Deliberately standing before the binnacle, and eyeing the transpointed compasses, the old man, with the sharp of his extended hand, now took the precise bearing of the sun, and satisfied that the needles were exactly inverted, shouted out his orders for the ship's course to be changed accordingly. The yards were hard up, and once more the Pequod thrust her undaunted bows into the opposing wind, for the supposed fair one had only been juggling her. Meanwhile, whatever were his own secret thoughts, Starbuck said nothing, but quietly he issued all requisite orders, while Stubb and Flask who in some small degree seemed then to be sharing his feelings likewise unmurmuringly acquiesced. As for the men, though some of them lowly rumbled, their fear of Ahab was greater than their fear of fate. But as ever before, the pagan Harpa Wonners remained almost wholly unimpressed, or if impressed, it was only with a certain magnetism shot into their congenial hearts from inflexible Ahabs. For a space the old man walked the deck in rolling reveries. But chancing to slip with his ivory heel, he saw the crushed copper sight tubes of the quadrant he had the day before dashed to the deck. Thou poor, proud heaven-gazer and sun's pilot. Yesterday I wrecked thee, and today the compasses would fain have wrecked me. So, so. But Ahab is lord over the level lodestone yet. Mr. Starbuck a lance without a pole, a top maul, and the smallest of the sailmaker's needles. Quick. Accessory, perhaps, to the impulse dictating the thing he was now about to do were certain prudential motives, whose object might have been to revive the spirits of his crew by a stroke of his subtle skill, in a matter so wondrous as that of the inverted compasses. Besides, the old man well knew that to steer by transpointed needles, though clumsily practicable, was not a thing to be passed over by superstitious sailors, without some shudderings and evil portents. Men, said he, steadily turning upon the crew, as the mate handed him the things he had demanded, my men, the thunder turned old Ahab's needles, but out of this bit of steel Ahab can make one of his own, that will point as true as any. Abashed glances of servile wonder were exchanged by the sailors, as this was said, and with fascinated eyes they awaited whatever magic might follow. But Starbuck looked away. With a blow from the top maul Ahab knocked off the steel head of the lance, and then handing to the mate the long iron rod remaining, bade him hold it upright, without its touching the deck. Then, with the maul, after repeatedly smiting the upper end of this iron rod, he placed the blunted needle endwise on the top of it, and less strongly hammered that, several times, the mate still holding the rod as before. Then going through some small strange motions with it whether indispensable to the magnetizing of the steel, or merely intended to augment the awe of the crew, is uncertain he called for linen thread, and moving to the binnacle, slipped out the two reversed needles there, and horizontally suspended the sail needle by its middle, over one of the compass cards. At first, the steel went round and round, quivering and vibrating at either end, but at last it settled to its place, when Ahab, who had been intently watching for this result, stepped frankly back from the binnacle, and pointing his stretched arm towards it, exclaimed look yet, for yourselves, if Ahab be not lord of the level lodestone. The sun is east, and that compass swears it. One after another they peered in, for nothing but their own eyes could persuade such ignorance as theirs, and one after another they slunk away. In his fiery eyes of scorn and triumph, you then saw Ahab in all his fatal pride. Chapter 125 The Log and Line 
While now the fated Pequot had been so long afloat this voyage, the log and line had but very seldom been in use. Owing to a confident reliance upon other means of determining the vessel's place, some merchantmen, and many whalemen, especially when cruising, wholly neglect to heave the log, though at the same time, and frequently more for form's sake than anything else, regularly putting down upon the customary slate the course steered by the ship, as well as the presumed average rate of progression every hour. It had been thus with the Pequod. The wooden reel and angular log attached hung, long untouched, just beneath the railing of the after bulwarks. Rains and spray had damped it, sun and wind had warped it, all the elements had combined to rot a thing that hung so idly. But heedless of all this, his mood seized Ahab, as he happened to glance upon the reel, not many hours after the magnet scene, and he remembered how his quadrant was no more, and recalled his frantic oath about the level lock and line. The ship was sailing plungingly, astern the billows rolled in riots. Forward, there. Heave the log. Two seamen came. The golden-hued Tahitian and the grisly Manxman. Take the reel, one of yet, I'll heave. They went towards the extreme stern, on the ship's lee side, where the deck, with the oblique energy of the wind, was now almost dipping into the creamy, sidelong rushing sea. The Manxman took the reel, and holding it high up, by the projecting handle ends of the spindle, round which the spool of line revolved, so stood with the angular log hanging downwards, till Ahab advanced to him. Ahab stood before him, and was lightly unwinding some thirty or forty turns to form a preliminary hand coil to toss overboard, when the old Manxman, who was intently eyeing both him and the line, made bold to speak. Sir, I mistrust it, this line looks far gone, long heat and wet have spoiled it. Twill hold, old gentleman. Long heat and wet, have they spoiled thee? Thou seemest tea to hold. Or, truer perhaps, life holds thee, not thou it. I hold the spool, sir. But just as my captain says. With these grey hairs of mine tis not worth while disputing, specially with a superior, who'll ne'er confess. What's that? There now's a patched professor in Queen Nature's granite-founded college, but methinks he's too subservient. Where wert thou born? In the little rocky Isle of Man, sir. Excellent. Thou hast t hit the world by that. I know not, sir, but I was born there. In the Isle of Man, hey? Well, the other way, it's good. Here's a man from man a man born in once independent man, and now unmanned of man, which is sucked in by what? Up with the real. The dead, blind wall butts all inquiring heads at last. Up with it. So. The log was heaved. The loose coils rapidly straightened out in a long dragging line astern, and then, instantly, the reel began to whirl. In turn, Jerkingly raised and lowered by the rolling billows, the towing resistance of the log caused the old reelman to stagger strangely. Hold hard. Snap. The overstrained line sagged down in one long festoon, the tugging log was gone. I crush the quadrant, the thunder turns the needles, and now the mad sea parts the log line. But Ahab can mend all. Haul in here, Tahitian. Reel up, Manxman. And look yet, let the carpenter make another log, and mend thou the line. See to it. There he goes now, to him nothing's happened, but to me, the skewer seems loosening out of the middle of the world. Haul in, haul in, Tahitian. These lines run whole, and whirling out, come in broken, and dragging slow. Ha, pip. Come to help, eh, Pip. Pip. Whom call ye Pip? Pip jumped from the whaleboat. Pip's missing. Let's see now if ye haven't fished him up here, fisherman. 
It drags hard, I guess he's holding on. Jerk him, Tahiti. Jerk him off, we haul and no cowards here. Ho. Oh. There's his arm just breaking water. A hatchet. A hatchet. Cut it off we haul and no cowards here. Captain Ahab. Sir, sir. Here's Pip, trying to get on board again. Peace, thou crazy loon, cried the Manxman, seizing him by the arm. Away from the quarter deck. The greater idiot ever scolds the lesser, muttered Ahab, advancing. Hands off from that holiness. Where sayest thou Pip was, boy? Astern there, sir, astern. Lo. Lo. And who art thou, boy? I see not my reflection in the vacant pupils of thy eyes. O oh God! That man should be a thing for immortal souls to see through. Who art thou, boy? Bellboy, sir, ship's crier, ding, dong, ding. Pip. 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 One hundred pounds of clay reward for Pip. Five feet high looks cowardly quickest known by that. Ding, dong, ding. Who seen Pip the coward? There can be no hearts above the snow line. Oh, ye frozen heavens. Look down here. Ye did beget this luckless child, and have abandoned him, ye creative libertines. Here, boy, Ahab's cabin shall be Pip's home henceforth, while Ahab lives. Thou too shayest my inmost center, boy, thou art tied to me by cords woven of my heart strings. Come, let's down. What's this? Here's velvet shark skin, intently gazing at Ahab's hand, and feeling it. Ah, now, had poor Pip but felt so kind a thing as this, perhaps he had ne'er been lost. This seems to me, sir, as a man rope something that weak souls may hold by. Oh, sir, let old Perth now come and rivet these two hands together, the black one with the white, for I will not let this go. Oh, boy, nor will I thee, unless I should thereby drag thee to worse horrors than are here. Come, then, to my cabin. Lo! Yet believers in God's all goodness, and in man all ill, lo you! See the omniscient gods oblivious of suffering man, and man, though idiotic, and knowing not what he does, yet full of the sweet things of love and gratitude. Come. I feel prouder leading thee by thy black hand, than though I grasped an emperor's. There go two daft ones now, muttered the old manxman. One daft with strength, the other daft with weakness. But here's the end of the rotten line all dripping, too. Mend it, eh? I think we had best have a new line altogether. I'll see Mr. Stubb about it. Chapter 126 The Life Buoy Steering now southeastward by Ahab's leveled steel, and her progress solely determined by Ahab's level log and line, the Pequot held on her path towards the equator. Making so long a passage through such unfrequented waters, descrying no ships, and ere long, sideways impelled by unvarying trade winds, over waves monotonously mild, all these seemed the strange calm things preluding some riotous and desperate scene. At last, when the ship drew near to the outskirts, as it were, of the equatorial fishing ground, and in the deep darkness that goes before the dawn, was sailing by a cluster of rocky islets, the watch then headed by Flask was startled by a cry so plaintively wild and unearthly like half-articulated wailings of the ghosts of all Herod's murdered innocents that one and all, they started from their reveries, and for the space of some moments stood, or sat, or leaned all transfixedly listening. Like the carved Roman slave, while that wild cry remained within hearing, the Christian or civilized part of the crew said it was mermaids, and shuddered, but the pagan Harpa winners remained unappalled. 
Yet the grey manxman the oldest mariner of all declared that the wild thrilling sounds that were heard, were the voices of newly drowned men in the sea. Below in his hammock, Ahab did not hear of this till grey dawn, when he came to the deck, it was then recounted to him by flask, not unaccompanied with hinted dark meanings. He hollowly laughed, and thus explained the wonder. Those rocky islands the ship had passed were the resort of great numbers of seals, and some young seals that had lost their dams, or some dams that had lost their cubs, must have risen nigh the ship and kept company with her, crying and sobbing with their human sort of wail. But this only the more affected some of them, because most mariners cherish a very superstitious feeling about seals, arising not only from their peculiar tones when in distress, but also from the human look of their round heads and semi-intelligent faces, seen peeringly uprising from the water alongside. In the sea, under certain circumstances, seals have more than once been mistaken for men. But the boatings of the crew were destined to receive a most plausible confirmation in the fate of one of their number that morning. At sunrise this man went from his hammock to his masthead at the fore, and whether it was that he was not yet half waked from his sleep, for sailors sometimes go aloft in a transition state, whether it was thus with the man, there is now no telling, but, be that as it may, he had not been long at his perch, when a cry was heard a cry and a rushing and looking up, they saw a falling phantom in the air, and looking down, a little tossed heap of white bubbles in the blue of the sea. The life buoy a long slender cask was dropped from the stern, where it always hung obedient to a cunning spring, but no hand rose to seize it, and the sun having long beat upon this cask it had shrunken, so that it slowly filled, and that parched wood also filled at its every pore, and the studded iron-bound cask followed the sailor to the bottom, as if to yield him his pillow, though in sooth but a hard one. And thus the first man of the Pequod that mounted the mast to look out for the white whale, on the white whale's own peculiar ground, that man was swallowed up in the deep. But few, perhaps, thought of that at the time. Indeed, in some sort, they were not grieved at this event, at least as a portent, for they regarded it, not as a foreshadowing of evil in the future, but as the fulfillment of an evil already presaged. They declared that now they knew the reason of those wild shrieks they had heard the night before. But again the old Manxman said nay. The lost life buoy was now to be replaced, Starbuck was directed to see to it, but as no cask of sufficient lightness could be found, and as in the feverish eagerness of what seemed the approaching crisis of the voyage, all hands were impatient of any toil but what was directly connected with its final end, whatever that might prove to be, Therefore, they were going to leave the ship's stern unprovided with a buoy, when by certain strange signs an inyun does Queequeg hinted a hint concerning his coffin. A life buoy of a coffin, cried Starbuck, starting. Rather queer, that, I should say, said Stubb. It will make a good enough one, said Flask, the carpenter here can arrange it easily. Bring it up. There's nothing else for it, said Starbuck, after a melancholy pause. Rig it, carpenter, do not look at me so the coffin, I mean. Dost thou hear me? Rig it. And shall I nail down the lid, sir, moving his hand as with a hammer? I. And shall I cock the seams, sir, moving his hand as with a cocking iron? I. And shall I then pay over the same with pitch, sir, moving his hand as with a pitch pot? Away! What possesses thee to this? Make a life buoy of the coffin, and no more Mr. Stubb, Mr. Flask, come forward with me. He goes off in a huff. The hole he can endure, at the parts he balks. Now I don't like this. I make a leg for Captain Ahab and he wears it like a gentleman, but I make a bandbox for Queequeg, and he won't put his head into it. Are all my pains to go for nothing with that coffin? And now I'm ordered to make a life buoy of it. It's like turning an old coat, 
going to bring the flesh on the other side now. I don't like this cobbling sort of business I don't like it at all, it's undignified, it's not my place. Let tinkers brats do tinkerings, we are their betters. I like to take in hand none but clean, virgin, fair and square mathematical jobs, something that regularly begins at the beginning, and is at the middle when midway, and comes to an end at the conclusion, not a cobbler's job, that's at an end in the middle, and at the beginning at the end. It's the old woman's tricks to be giving cobbling jobs. Lord! What an affection all old women have for tinkers! I know an old woman of 65 who ran away with a bald-headed young tinker once. And that's the reason I never would work for lonely widow old women ashore, when I kept my job shop in the vineyard, they might have taken it into their lonely old heads to run off with me. But hey ho! There are no caps at sea but snow caps. Let me see. Nail down the lid, cock the seams, pay over the same with pitch batten them down tight, and hang it with the snap spring over the ship's stern. Were ever such things done before with a coffin? Some superstitious old carpenters, now, would be tied up in the rigging, ere they would do the job. But I'm made of naughty rustic hemlock, I don't budge. Cruppered with a coffin, sailing about with a graveyard tray. But never mind. We workers in woods make bridal bedsteads and card tables, as well as coffins and hearses. We work by the month, or by the job, or by the profit, not for us to ask the why and wherefore of our work, unless it be too confounded cobbling, and then we stash it if we can. Ham. I'll do the job, now, tenderly. I'll have me let's see how many in the ship's company, all told. But I've forgotten. Anyway, I'll have me thirty separate, Turks-headed lifelines, each three feet long hanging all round to the coffin. Then, if the hull go down, there'll be thirty lively fellows all fighting for one coffin, a sight not seen very often beneath the sun. Come hammer, caulking iron, pitch pot, and marling spike. Let's do it. Chapter 127 The Deck The coffin laid upon two line tubs, between the vice bench and the open hatchway, the carpenter caulking its seams, the string of twisted oakum slowly unwinding from a large roll of it placed in the bosom of his frock Ahab comes slowly from the cabin gangway, and here's Pip following him. Back, lad, I will be with ye again presently. He goes. Not this hand complies with my humor more genially than that boy middle aisle of a church. What's here? Life buoy, sir. Mr. Starbucks orders. Oh, look, sir. Beware the hatchway. Thank ya, man. Thy coffin lies handy to the vault. Sir. The hatchway? Oh. So it does, sir. So it does. Art not thou the leg maker? Look, did not this stump come from thy shop? I believe it did, sir, does the feral stand, sir? Well enough. But art thou not also the undertaker? I, sir, I patched up this thing here as a coffin for Queequeg, but they've set me now to turning it into something else. Then tell me, Art thou not an errant, all grasping, intermeddling, monopolizing, heathenish old scamp, to be one day making legs, and the next day coffins to clap them in, and yet again life boys out of those same coffins? Thou art as unprincipled as the gods, and as much of a jack of all trades. But I do not mean anything, sir. I do as I do. The gods again. Hark yet. Dost thou not ever sing working about a coffin? The titans, they say, hummed snatches when chipping out the craters for volcanoes, and the grave digger in the play sings, spade in hand. Dost thou never sing, sir? Do I sing? Oh, I'm indifferent enough, 
sir, for that, but the reason why the gravedigger made music must have been because there was none in his spade, sir. But the cocking mallet is full of it. Hark to it. I, and that's because the lid there's a sounding board, and what in all things makes the sounding board is this there's not beneath. And yet, a coffin with a body in it rings pretty much the same, carpenter. Hast thou ever helped carry a beer, and heard the coffin knock against the churchyard gate, going in? Faith, sir, I've. Faith. What's that? Why, faith, sir, it's only a sort of exclamation like that's all, sir. Um, um, go on. I was about to say, sir, that. Art thou a silkworm? Dost thou spin thy own shroud out of thyself? Look at thy bosom. Dispatch. And get these traps out of sight. He goes aft. That was sudden, now, but squalls come sudden in hot latitudes. I've heard that the Isle of Albemarle, one of the Gallipagos, is cut by the equator right in the middle. Seems to me some sort of equator cuts yon old man, too, right in his middle. He's always under the line fiery hot, I tell ya. He's looking this way come, oakum, quick. Here we go again. This wooden mallet is the cork, and I'm the professor of musical glasses tap, tap. Ahab to himself. There's a sight. There's a sound. The gray-headed woodpecker tapping the hollow tree. Blind and dumb might well be envied now. See. That thing rests on two line tubs, full of tow lines. A most malicious wag, that fellow. Rat-tat. So man's seconds tick. Oh. How immaterial are all materials. What things real are there, but imponderable thoughts. Here now's the very dreaded symbol of grim death, by a mere hap, made the expressive sign of the help and hope of most endangered life. A life buoy of a coffin. Does it go further? Can it be that in some spiritual sense the coffin is, after all, but an immortality preserver. I'll think of that. But no. So far gone am I in the dark side of Earth, that its other side, the theoretic bright one, seems but uncertain twilight to me. Will ya never have done, Carpenter, with that accursed sound? I go below, let me not see that thing here when I return again. Now, then, Pip, we'll talk this over. I do suck most wondrous philosophies from thee. Some unknown condits from the unknown worlds must empty into thee. Chapter 128 The Pequod Meets the Rachel Next day, a large ship, the Rachel, was descried, bearing directly down upon the Pequod, all her spars thickly clustering with men. At the time the Pequod was making good speed through the water, but as the broad-winged windward stranger shot nigh to her, the boastful sails all fell together as blank bladders that are burst, and all life fled from the smitten hull. Bad news, she brings bad news, muttered the old manxman. But ere her commander, who, with trumpet to mouth, stood up in his boat, ere he could hopefully hail, Ahab's voice was heard. Hast seen the white whale? I yesterday. Have ye seen a whaleboat adrift? Throttling his joy, Ahab negatively answered this unexpected question, and would then have fain boarded the stranger, when the stranger captain himself, having stopped his vessel's way, was seen descending her side. A few keen pulls, and his boat hook soon clinched the Pequod's main chains, and he sprang to the deck. Immediately he was recognized by Ahab for a Nantucketer he knew. But no formal salutation was exchanged. Where was he, not killed, not killed, cried Ahab, closely advancing. How was it? It seemed that somewhat late on the afternoon of the day previous, while three of the strangers' boats were engaged with a shoal of whales, 
which had led them some four or five miles from the ship, and while they were yet in swift chase to windward, the white hump and head of Moby Dick had suddenly loomed up out of the water, not very far to leeward, whereupon, the fourth rigged boat a reserved one had been instantly lowered in chase. After a keen sail before the wind, this fourth boat the swiftest keeled of all seemed to have succeeded in fastening at least, as well as the man at the masthead could tell anything about it. In the distance he saw the diminished dotted boat, and then a swift gleam of bubbling white water, and after that nothing more, whence it was concluded that the stricken whale must have indefinitely run away with his pursuers, as often happens. There was some apprehension, but no positive alarm, as yet. The recall signals were placed in the rigging, darkness came on, and forced to pick up her three far to windward boats ere going in quest of the fourth one in the precisely opposite direction the ship had not only been necessitated to leave that boat to its fate till near midnight, but, for the time, to increase her distance from it. But the rest of her crew being at last safe aboard, she crowded all sail stunsail on stunsail after the missing boat, kindling a fire in her tripods for a beacon, and every other man aloft on the lookout. But though when she had thus sailed a sufficient distance to gain the presumed place of the absent ones when last seen, though she then paused to lower her spare boats to pull all around her, and not finding anything, had again dashed on, again paused, and lowered her boats, and though she had thus continued doing till daylight, yet not the least glimpse of the missing keel had been seen. The story told, the stranger captain immediately went on to reveal his object in boarding the Pequod. He desired that ship to unite with his own in the search, by sailing over the sea some four or five miles apart, on parallel lines, and so sweeping a double horizon, as it were. I will wager something now, whispered Stubb to Flask, that someone in that missing boat wore off that captain's best coat, mayhap, his watch he's so cursed anxious to get it back. Who ever heard of two pious whale ships cruising after one missing whale boat in the height of the whaling season? See, Flask, only see how pale he looks pale in the very buttons of his eyes look it wasn't the coat it must have been they. My boy, my own boy is among them. For God's sake I beg, I conjure here exclaimed the stranger captain to Ahab, who thus far had but icily received his petition. For eight and forty hours let me charter your ship I will gladly pay for it, and roundly pay for it if there be no other way for eight and forty hours only only that you must, oh, you must, and you shall do this thing. His son, cried Stubb, oh, it's his son he's lost. I take back the coat and watch what says Ahab. We must save that boy. He's drowned with the rest on em, last night, said the old Manx sailor standing behind them, I heard, all of ye heard their spirits. Now, as it shortly turned out, what made this incident of the Rachels the more melancholy, was the circumstance, that not only was one of the captain's sons among the number of the missing boat's crew, but among the number of the other boat's crews, at the same time, but on the other hand, separated from the ship during the dark vicissitudes of the chase, there had been still another son, as that for a time, the wretched father was plunged to the bottom of the cruelest perplexity, which was only solved for him by his chief mates instinctively adopting the ordinary procedure of a whale ship in such emergencies, that is, when placed between jeopardized but divided boats, always to pick up the majority first. But the captain, for some unknown constitutional reason, had refrained from mentioning all this, and not till forced to it by Ahab's iciness did he allude to his one yet missing boy, a little lad, but twelve years old, whose father with the earnest but unmisgiving hardihood of an Nantucketer's paternal love, had thus early sought to initiate him in the perils and wonders of a vocation almost immemorially the destiny of all his race. Nor does it unfrequently occur, that Nantucket captains will send a son of such tender age away from them, for a protracted three or four years voyage in some other ship than their own, 
so that their first knowledge of a whaleman's career shall be unenervated by any chance display of a father's natural but untimely partiality, or undue apprehensiveness and concern. Meantime, now the stranger was still beseeching his poor boon of Ahab, and Ahab still stood like an anvil, receiving every shock, but without the least quivering of his own. I will not go, said the stranger, till you say I to me. Do to me as you would have me do to you in the like case. For you too have a boy, Captain Ahab though but a child, and nestling safely at home now a child of your old age too yes, yes, you relent, I see it run, run, men, now, and stand by to square in the yards. Avast, cried Ahab touch not a rope yarn, then in a voice that prolongingly molded every word Captain Gardner, I will not do it. Even now I lose time. Goodbye, goodbye. God bless yet, man, and may I forgive myself, but I must go. Mr. Starbuck, look at the binnacle watch, and in three minutes from this present instant warn off all strangers, then brace forward again, and let the ship sail as before. Hurriedly turning, with averted face, he descended into his cabin, leaving the strange captain transfixed at this unconditional and utter rejection of his so earnest suit. But starting from his enchantment, Gardner silently hurried to the side, more fell than stepped into his boat, and returned to his ship. Soon the two ships diverged their wakes, and long as the strange vessel was in view, she was seen to yaw hither and thither at every dark spot, however small, on the sea. This way and that her yards were swung round, starboard and larboard, she continued to tack, now she beat against a head sea, and again it pushed her before it, while all the while, her masts and yards were thickly clustered with men, as three tall cherry trees, when the boys are cherrying among the boughs. But by her still halting course and winding, woeful way, you plainly saw that this ship that so wept with spray, still remained without comfort. She was Rachel, weeping for her children, because they were not. Chapter 129 The Cabin Ahab moving to go on deck, Pip catches him by the hand to follow. Lad, lad, I tell thee thou must not follow Ahab now. The hour is coming when Ahab would not scare thee from him, yet would not have thee by him. There is that in thee, poor lad, which I feel too curing to my malady. Like cures like, and for this hunt, my malady becomes my most desired health. Do thou abide below here, where they shall serve thee, as if thou wert the captain. I, lad, thou shalt sit here in my own screwed chair, another screw to it, thou must be. No, no, no. Ye have not a whole body, sir, do ye but use poor me for your one lost leg, only tread upon me, sir, I ask no more, so I remain a part of ye. Oh! Spite of million villains, this makes me a bigot in the fateless fidelity of man, and a black. And crazy, but methinks like cures like applies to him too, he grows so sane again. They tell me, sir that Stubb did once desert poor little Pip, whose drowned bones now show white, for all the blackness of his living skin. But I will never desert yet, sir, as Stubb did him. Sir, I must go with yet. If thou speakest thus to me much more, Ahab's purpose keels up in him. I tell thee no, it cannot be. O oh, good master, master, master! Weep so, and I will murder thee. Have a care, for Ahab too is mad. Listen, and thou wilt often hear my ivory foot upon the deck, and still know that I am there. And now I quit thee. Thy hand, met. True art thou, lad, as the circumference to its center. So, God forever bless thee, and if it come to that God forever save thee, let what will befall. Ahab goes, Pip steps one step forward. Here he this instant stood, I stand in his air but I'm alone. 
Now were even poor Pip here I could endure it, but he's missing. Pip. Pip. Ding, dong, ding. Who's seen Pip? He must be up here, let's try the door. What? Neither lock, nor bolt, nor bar, and yet there's no opening it. It must be the spell, he told me to stay here, I, and told me this screwed chair was mine. Here, then, I'll seat me, against the transom, in the ship's full middle, all her keel and her three masts before me. Here, our old sailors say, in their black seventy-fours great admirals sometimes sit at table, and lord it over rows of captains and lieutenants. Ha! What's this? Epaulets. Epaulets. The epaulets all come crowding. Pass round the decanters, glad to see yet, fill up, messieurs. What an odd feeling, now, when a black boy's host to white men with gold lace upon their coats, messieurs, have ye seen one pip, a little negro lad, five feet high, hangdog look, and cowardly. Jumped from a whaleboat once, seen him? No. Well then, fill up again, captains, and let's drink shame upon all cowards. I name no names. Shame upon them. Put one foot upon the table. Shame upon all cowards hissed. Above there, I hear ivory oh, master. Master. I am indeed downhearted when you walk over me. But here I'll stay, though this stern strikes rocks, and they bulge through, and oysters come to join me. Chapter 130 The Hat And now that at the proper time and place, after so long and wide a preliminary cruise, Ahab all other wailing waters swept seemed to have chased his foe into an ocean fold, to slay him the more securely there, now, that he found himself hard by the very latitude and longitude where his tormenting wound had been inflicted, now that a vessel had been spoken which on the very day preceding had actually encountered Moby Dick, and now that all his successive meetings with various ships contrastingly concurred to show the demoniac indifference with which the white whale tore his hunters, whether sinning or sinned against, now it was that there lurked a something in the old man's eyes, which it was hardly sufferable for feeble souls to see. As the unsetting polar star, which through the livelong, arctic, Six months' night sustains its piercing, steady, central gaze, so Ahab's purpose now fixedly gleamed down upon the constant midnight of the gloomy crew. It domineered above them so, that all their bodings, doubts, misgivings, fears, were fain to hide beneath their souls, and not sprout forth a single spear or leaf. In this foreshadowing interval too, all humor, forced or natural, vanished. Stubb no more strove to raise a smile, Starbuck no more strove to check one. Alike, joy and sorrow, hope and fear, seemed ground to finest dust, and powdered, for the time, in the clamped mortar of Ahab's iron soul. Like machines, they dumbly moved about the deck, ever conscious that the old man's despot eye was on them. But did you deeply scan him in his more secret confidential hours, when he thought no glance but one was on him, then you would have seen that even as Ahab's eyes so awed the crews, the inscrutable Parsi's glance awed his, or somehow, at least, in some wild way, at times affected it. Such an added, gliding strangeness began to invest the thin Fidala now, such ceaseless shudderings shook him, that the men looked dubious at him half uncertain, as it seemed, whether indeed he were a mortal substance, or else a tremulous shadow cast upon the deck by some unseen being's body. And that shadow was always hovering there. For not by night, even, had Fidala ever certainly been known to slumber, or go below. He would stand still for hours, but never sat or leaned, his wan but wondrous eyes did plainly say we two watchmen never rest. Nor, at any time, by night or day could the mariners now step upon the deck, unless Ahab was before them, 
either standing in his pivot hole, or exactly pacing the planks between two undeviating limits the mainmast and the mizzen, or else they saw him standing in the cabin scuttle his living foot advanced upon the deck, as if to step, his hat slouched heavily over his eyes, so that however motionless he stood, however the days and nights were added on, that he had not swung in his hammock, yet. Hidden beneath that slouching hat, they could never tell unerringly whether, for all this, his eyes were really closed at times, or whether he was still intently scanning them, no matter, though he stood so in the scuttle for a whole hour on the stretch, and the unheeded night damp gathered in beads of dew upon that stone-carved coat and hat. The clothes that the night had wet, the next day's sunshine dried upon him, and so, day after day, and night after night, he went no more beneath the planks, whatever he wanted from the cabin that thing he sent for. He ate in the same open air, that is, his two only meals breakfast and dinner, supper he never touched, nor reaped his beard, which darkly grew all gnarled, as unearthed roots of trees blown over, which still grow idly on at naked base, though perished in the upper verdure. But though his whole life was now become one watch on deck, and though the Parsi's mystic watch was without intermission as his own, yet these two never seemed to speak one man to the other unless at long intervals some passing unmomentous matter made it necessary. Though such a potent spell seemed secretly to join the twain, openly, and to the awestruck crew, they seemed pole like asunder. If by day they chanced to speak one word, by night, dumb men were both, so far as concerned the slightest verbal interchange. At times, for longest hours, without a single hail, they stood far parted in the starlight, Ahab in his scuttle, the Parsi by the mainmast, but still fixedly gazing upon each other, as if in the Parsi Ahab saw his forethroned shadow, in Ahab the Parsi his abandoned substance. And yet, somehow, did Ahab in his own proper self, as daily, hourly, and every instant, commandingly revealed to his subordinates Ahab seemed an independent lord, the Parsi but his slave. Still again both seemed yoked together, and an unseen tyrant driving them, the lean shade siding the solid rib. For be this Parsi what he may, all rib and keel was solid Ahab. At the first faintest glimmering of the dawn, his iron voice was heard from aft man the mastheads. And all through the day, till after sunset and after twilight, the same voice every hour, at the striking of the helmsman's bell, was heard what do ye see, sharp, sharp. But when three or four days had slided by, after meeting the children seeking Rachel, and no spout had yet been seen, the monomaniac old man seemed distrustful of his crew's fidelity, at least, of nearly all except the pagan Harpa Wonders, he seemed to doubt, even, whether Stubb and Flask might not willingly overlook the sight he sought. But if these suspicions were really his, he sagaciously refrained from verbally expressing them, however his actions might seem to hint them. I will have the first sight of the whale myself, he said. I. Ahab must have the doubloon, and with his own hands he rigged a nest of basket bullens, and sending a hand aloft, with a single sheathed block, to secure to the mainmast head, he received the two ends of the downward reefed rope, and attaching one to his basket prepared a pin for the other end, in order to fasten it at the rail. This done, with that end yet in his hand and standing beside the pin, he looked round upon his crew, sweeping from one to the other, pausing his glance long upon Dagu, Queequeg, Tash Tigo, but shunning Fidala, and then settling his firm relying eye upon the chief mate, said take the rope, sir I give it into thy hands, Starbuck. Then arranging his person in the basket, he gave the word for them to hoist him to his perch, Starbuck being the one who secured the rope at last, and afterwards stood near it. And thus, with one hand clinging round the royal mast, Ahab gazed abroad upon the sea for miles and miles ahead, astern, this side, and that within the wide expanded circle commanded at so great a height. 
when in working with his hands at some lofty almost isolated place in the rigging, which chances to afford no foothold, the sailor at sea is hoisted up to that spot, and sustained there by the rope, under these circumstances, its fastened end on deck is always given in strict charge to some one man who has the special watch of it. Because in such a wilderness of running rigging, whose various different relations aloft cannot always be infallibly discerned by what is seen of them at the deck, and when the deck ends of these ropes are being every few minutes cast down from the fastenings, it would be but a natural fatality, if, unprovided with a constant watchman, the hoisted sailor should by some carelessness of the crew be cast adrift and fall all swooping to the sea. So Ahab's proceedings in this matter were not unusual, the only strange thing about them seemed to be, that Starbuck, almost the one only man who had ever ventured to oppose him with anything in the slightest degree approaching to decision one of those two, whose faithfulness on the lookout he had seemed to doubt somewhat, it was strange, that this was the very man he should select for his watchman, freely giving his whole life into such an otherwise distrusted person's hands. Now, the first time Ahab was perched aloft, ere he had been there ten minutes, one of those red-billed savage seahawks which so often fly incommodiously close round the manned mastheads of whalemen in these latitudes, one of these birds came wheeling and screaming round his head in a maze of untrackably swift circlings. Then it darted a thousand feet straight up into the air, then spiralized downwards, and went eddying again round his head. But with his gaze fixed upon the dim and distant horizon, Ahab seemed not to mark this wild bird, nor, indeed, would anyone else have marked it much, it being no uncommon circumstance, only now almost the least heedful eye seemed to see some sort of cunning meaning in almost every sight. Your hat, your hat, sir, suddenly cried the Sicilian seaman, who being posted at the mizzen masthead, stood directly behind Ahab, though somewhat lower than his level, and with a deep gulf of air dividing them. But already the sable wing was before the old man's eyes, the long hooked bill at his head, with a scream, the black hawk darted away with his prize. An eagle flew thrice round Tarquin's head, removing his cap to replace it, and thereupon Tonaquil, his wife, declared that Tarquin would be king of Rome. But only by the replacing of the cap was that omen accounted good. Ahab's hat was never restored, the wild hawk flew on and on with it, far in advance of the prow, and at last disappeared, while from the point of that disappearance, a minute black spot was dimly discerned, falling from that vast height into the sea. Chapter 131 The Pequod Meets the Delight The intense Pequod sailed on, the rolling waves and days went by, the life buoy coffin still lightly swung, and another ship, most miserably misnamed the Delight, was descried. As she drew nigh, all eyes were fixed upon her broad beams, called shears, which, in some whaling ships, cross the quarter deck at the height of eight or nine feet, serving to carry the spare, unrigged, or disabled boats. Upon the stranger's shears were beheld the shattered, white ribs, and some few splintered planks, of what had once been a whale boat, but you now saw through this wreck, as plainly as you see through the peeled, half unhinged, and bleaching skeleton of a horse. Hast seen the white whale? Look, replied the hollow-cheeked captain from his taffrail, and with his trumpet he pointed to the wreck. Hast killed him? The harpoon is not yet forged that ever will do that, answered the other sadly glancing upon a rounded hammock on the deck, whose gathered sides some noiseless sailors were busy in sewing together. Not forged, and snatching Perth's leveled iron from the crotch, Ahab held it out, exclaiming look ya, Nantucketer, here in this hand I hold his death. Tempered in blood, and tempered by lightning are these barbs, and I swear to temper them triply in that hot place behind the fin where the white whale most feels his accursed life. Then God keep thee, old man CST thou that, pointing to the hammock I buried but one of five stout men, who were alive only yesterday, but were dead ere night. 
only that one I bury, the rest were buried before they died, you sail upon their tomb. Then turning to his crew are ye ready there? Place the plank then on the rail, and lift the body, so, then oh! God advancing towards the hammock with uplifted hands may the resurrection and the life. Brace forward! Up helm, cried Ahab like lightning to his men. But the suddenly started Pequod was not quick enough to escape the sound of the splash that the corpse soon made as it struck the sea, not so quick, indeed, but that some of the flying bubbles might have sprinkled her hull with their ghostly baptism. As Ahab now glided from the dejected delight, the strange life buoy hanging at the Pequod's stern came into conspicuous relief. Ha! Yonder! Look yonder, men! cried a foreboding voice in her wake. In vain, oh, ye yeah strangers, ye yeah fly our sad burial, ye yeah but turn us your taffrail to show us your coffin. Chapter 132 The Symphony It was a clear steel blue day. The firmaments of air and sea were hardly separable in that all-pervading azure, only, the pensive air was transparently pure and soft with a woman's look, and the robust and manlike sea heaved with long, strong, lingering swells, as Samson's chest in his sleep. Hither, and thither, on high, glided the snow-white wings of small, unspeckled birds, these were the gentle thoughts of the feminine air, but to and fro in the deeps, far down in the bottomless blue, rushed mighty leviathans, swordfish, and sharks, and these were the strong, troubled, murderous thinkings of the masculine sea. But though thus contrasting within, the contrast was only in shades and shadows without, those two seemed one, it was only the sex, as it were, that distinguished them. Aloft, like a royal czar and king, the sun seemed giving this gentle air to this bold and rolling sea, even as bride to groom. And at the girdling line of the horizon, a soft and tremulous motion most seen here at the equator denoted the fond, throbbing trust, the loving alarms, with which the poor bride gave her bosom away. Tied up and twisted, gnarled and knotted with wrinkles, haggardly firm and unyielding, his eyes glowing like coals, that still glow in the ashes of ruin, untottering Ahab stood forth in the clearness of the morn, lifting his splintered helmet of a brow to the fair girl's forehead of heaven. O oh, immortal infancy and innocency of the azure! Invisible winged creatures that frolic all round us! Sweet childhood of air and sky! How oblivious were ye of old Ahab's close-coiled woe! But so have I seen little Miriam and Martha, laughing-eyed elves, heedlessly gambol around their old sire, sporting with the circle of singed locks which grew on the marge of that burnt-out crater of his brain. Slowly crossing the deck from the scuttle, Ahab leaned over the side and watched how his shadow in the water sank and sank to his gaze, the more and the more that he strove to pierce the profundity. But the lovely aromas in that enchanted air did at last seem to dispel, for a moment, the cankerous thing in his soul. That glad, happy air, that winsome sky, did at last stroke and caress him, the stepmother world so long cruel forbidding now threw affectionate arms round his stubborn neck, and did seem to joyously sob over him, as if over one, that however willful and erring, she could yet find it in her heart to save and to bless. From beneath his slouched hat Ahab dropped a tear into the sea, nor did all the Pacific contain such wealth as that one we drop. Starbuck saw the old man, saw him, how he heavily leaned over the side, and he seemed to hear in his own true heart the measureless sobbing that stole out of the center of the serenity around. Careful not to touch him, or be noticed by him, he yet drew near to him, and stood there. Ahab turned. Starbuck. Sir. Oh, Starbuck. It is a mild, mild wind, and a mild-looking sky. On such a day very much such a sweetness as this I struck my first whale a boy harpooner of eighteen. Forty 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 years ago, ago. Forty years of continual whaling. 
Forty years of privation and peril and storm time. Forty years on the pitiless sea. For forty years has Ahab forsaken the peaceful land, for forty years to make war on the horrors of the deep. I and yes, Starbuck, out of those forty years I have not spent three ashore. When I think of this life I have led, the desolation of solitude it has been, the mass owned, walled town of a captain's exclusiveness, which admits but small entrance to any sympathy from the green country without oh, weariness, heaviness, Guinea coast slavery of solitary command, when I think of all this, only half suspected, not so keenly known to me before and how for forty years I have fed upon dry salted fair fit emblem of the dry nourishment of my soil, when the poorest landsman has had fresh fruit to his daily hand, and broken the world's fresh bread to my moldy crusts away, whole oceans away, from that young girl wife I wedded past fifty, and sailed for Cape Horn the next day, leaving but one dent in my marriage pillow. Wife? Wife, rather a widow with her husband alive. I, I widowed that poor girl when I married her, Starbuck, and then, the madness, the frenzy, the boiling blood and the smoking brow, with which, for a thousand lowerings old Ahab has furiously, foamingly chased his prey more a demon than a man, I, I. What a forty years fool fool old fool, has old Ahab been? Why this strife of the chase? Why weary, and palsy the arm at the oar, and the iron, and the lance? How the richer or better is Ahab now? Behold! Oh, Starbuck! Is it not hard, that with this weary load I bear, one poor leg should have been snatched from under me? Here, brush this old hair aside, it blinds me, that I seem to weep. Locks so grey did never grow but from out some ashes. But do I look very old, so very, very old, Starbuck? I feel deadly faint, bowed, and humped, as though I were Adam, staggering beneath the piled centuries since paradise. God! 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 Crack my heart, stave my brain, mockery! Mockery! Bitter, biting mockery of grey hairs, have I lived enough joy to wear yet, and seem and feel thus intolerably old? Close! Stand close to me, Starbuck, let me look into a human eye, it is better than to gaze into sea or sky, better than to gaze upon God. By the green land, by the bright hearthstone. This is the magic glass, man, I see my wife and my child in thine eye. No, no, stay on board, on board, lower not when I do, when branded Ahab gives chase to Moby Dick. That hazard shall not be thine. No, no. Not with the far away home I see in that eye. Oh, my captain. My captain. Noble soul. Grand old heart, after all. Why should any one give chase to that hated fish? Away with me. Let us fly these deadly waters. Let us home. Wife and child, too are Starbuck's wife and child of his brotherly, sisterly, playfellow youth, even as thine, sir, are the wife and child of thy loving, longing, paternal old age. Away! Let us away, this instant let me alter the course. How cheerily, how hilariously, O oh my captain, would we bowl on our way to see old Nantucket again. I think, sir, they have some such mild blue days, even as this, in Nantucket. They have, they have. I have seen them some summer days in the morning. About this time yes, it is his noon nap now the boy vivaciously wakes, sits up in bed, and his mother tells him of me, of cannibal old me, how I am abroad upon the deep, but will yet come back to dance him again. Tis my Mary, my Mary herself. She promised that my boy, every morning, should be carried to the hill to catch the first glimpse of his father's sail. Yes, yes. No more. 
It is done. We head for Nantucket. Come, my captain, study out the course, and let us away. See, see. The boy's face from the window. The boy's hand on the hill. But Ahab's glance was averted, like a blighted fruit tree he shook, and cast his last, cindered apple to the soil. What is it, what nameless, inscrutable, unearthly thing is it, what cousining, hidden lord and master, and cruel, remorseless emperor commands me, that against all natural lovings and longings, I so keep pushing, and crowding, and jamming myself on all the time, recklessly making me ready to do what in my own proper, natural heart, I durst not so much as dare. Is Ahab, Ahab? Is it I, God, or who, that lifts this arm? But if the great sun move not of himself, but is as an errant boy in heaven, nor one single star can revolve, but by some invisible power, how then can this one small heart beat, this one small brain think thoughts, unless God does that beating, does that thinking, does that living, and not I? By heaven, man, we are turned round and round in this world, like yonder windless, and fate is the hand spike. And all the time, lo, that smiling sky, and this unsound sea. Look. See yon all be core. Who put it into him to chase and fang that flying fish? Where do murderers go, man? Who's to doom, when the judge himself is dragged to the bar? But it is a mild, mild wind, and a mild looking sky, and the air smells now, as if it blew from a faraway meadow, they have been making hay somewhere under the slopes of the Andes, Starbuck and the Mowers are sleeping among the new mown hay. Sleeping? I, toil we how we may, we all sleep at last on the field. Sleep? I, and rust amid greenness, as last year's scythes flung down, and left in the half-cut swath Starbuck. But blanched to a corpse's hue with despair, the mate had stolen away. Ahab crossed the deck to gaze over on the other side, but started at two reflected, fixed eyes in the water there. Fidala was motionlessly leaning over the same rail. Chapter 133 The Chase First Day That night, in the mid-watch, when the old man as his wont at intervals stepped forth from the scuttle in which he leaned, and went to his pivot hole, he suddenly thrust out his face fiercely, snuffing up the sea air as a sagacious ship's dog will, in drawing nigh to some barbarous isle. He declared that a whale must be near. Soon that peculiar odor, sometimes to a great distance given forth by the living sperm whale, was palpable to all the watch, nor was any mariner surprised when, after inspecting the compass, and then the dog vane, and then ascertaining the precise bearing of the odor as nearly as possible, Ahab rapidly ordered the ship's course to be slightly altered, and the sail to be shortened. The acute policy dictating these movements was sufficiently vindicated at daybreak, by the sight of a long sleek on the sea directly and lengthwise ahead, smooth as oil, and resembling in the pleated watery wrinkles bordering it, the polished metallic-like marks of some swift tide rip, at the mouth of a deep, rapid stream. Man the mastheads. Call all hands. Thundering with the butts of three clubbed hand spikes on the forecastle deck, Dog aroused the sleepers with such judgment claps that they seemed to exhale from the scuttle, so instantaneously did they appear with their clothes in their hands. What do ye see? cried Ahab, flattening his face to the sky. Nothing, nothing sir was the sound hailing down in reply. T gallant sails, stun sails, alow and aloft, and on both sides. All sail being set, he now cast loose the lifeline, reserved for swaying him to the main royal masthead, and in a few moments they were hoisting him thither, when, while but two-thirds of the way aloft, and while peering ahead through the horizontal vacancy between the main topsail and top gallant sail, he raised a gold-like cry in the air. There she blows, there she blows. 
A hump like a snow hill. It is Moby Dick. Fired by the cry which seemed simultaneously taken up by the three lookouts, the men on deck rushed to the rigging to behold the famous whale they had so long been pursuing. Ahab had now gained his final perch, some feet above the other lookouts, Tash Tico standing just beneath him on the cap of the top gallant mast, so that the Indian's head was almost on a level with Ahab's heel. From this height the whale was now seen some mile or so ahead, at every roll of the sea revealing his high sparkling hump, and regularly jetting his silent spout into the air. To the credulous mariners it seemed the same silent spout they had so long ago beheld in the moonlit Atlantic and Indian oceans. And did none of ye see it before, cried Ahab, hailing the perched men all around him. I saw him almost that same instant, sir, that Captain Ahab did, and I cried out, said Tash Tigo. Not the same instant, not the same no, the doubloon is mine, fate reserved the doubloon for me. I only, none of ye could have raised the white whale first. There she blows, there she blows, there she blows. There again, there again, he cried, in long drawn, lingering, methodic tones attuned to the gradual prolongings of the whale's visible jets. He's going to sound. In stun sails. Down top gallant sails. Stand by three boats. Mr. Starbuck, remember, stay on board, and keep the ship. Helm there. Luff, luff a point. So, steady, man, steady. There go flukes. No, no, only black water. Already the boat's there? Stand by, stand by. Lower me, Mr. Starbuck, lower, lower quick, quicker, and he slid through the air to the deck. He is heading straight to leeward, sir, cried Stubb, right away from us, cannot have seen the ship yet. Be dumb, man. Stand by the braces. Hard down the helm, brace up. Shiver her, shiver her, so, well that. Boats, boats. Soon all the boats but Starbucks were dropped, all the boat sails set all the paddles plying, with rippling swiftness, shooting to leeward, and Ahab heading the onset. A pale, death glimmer lit up Fidala's sunken eyes, a hideous motion gnawed his mouth. Like noiseless nautilus shells, their light prows sped through the sea, but only slowly they neared the foe. As they neared him, the ocean grew still more smooth, seemed drawing a carpet over its waves, seemed a noon meadow, so serenely it spread. At length the breathless hunter came so nigh his seemingly unsuspecting prey, that his entire dazzling hump was distinctly visible, sliding along the sea as if an isolated thing and continually set in a revolving ring of finest, fleecy, greenish foam. He saw the vast, involved wrinkles of the slightly projecting head beyond. Before it, far out on the soft Turkish rugged waters, went the glistening white shadow from his broad, milky forehead, a musical rippling playfully accompanying the shade, and behind, the blue waters interchangeably flowed over into the moving valley of his steady wake and on either hand bright bubbles arose and danced by his side. But these were broken again by the light toes of hundreds of gay fowl softly feathering the sea, alternate with their fitful flight, and like to some flagstaff rising from the painted hull of an argosy, the tall but shattered pole of a recent lance projected from the white whale's back, and at intervals one of the cloud of soft-toed fowls hovering, and to and fro scheming like a canopy over the fish, silently perched and rocked on this pole, the long tail feathers streaming like pennons. A gentle joyousness a mighty mildness of repose and swiftness, invested the gliding whale. Not the white bull Jupiter swimming away with ravished Europa clinging to his graceful horns, his lovely, leering eyes sideways intent upon the maid, with smooth bewitching fleetness, rippling straight for the nuptial bower in Crete, not Jove, not that great majesty supreme, did surpass the glorified white whale as he so divinely swam. 
on each soft side coincident with the parted swell, that but once leaving him, then flowed so wide away on each bright side, the whale shed off enticings. No wonder there had been some among the hunters who namelessly transported and allured by all this serenity, had ventured to assail it, but had fatally found that quietude but the vesture of tornadoes. Yet calm, enticing calm, oh, whale! Thou glidest on, to all who for the first time eye thee, no matter how many in that same way thou mayest have bejuggled and destroyed before. And thus, through the serene tranquillities of the tropical sea, among waves whose hand clappings were suspended by exceeding rapture, Moby Dick moved on, still withholding from sight the full terrors of his submerged trunk, entirely hiding the wrenched hideousness of his jaw. But soon the forepart of him slowly rose from the water, for an instant his whole marbleized body formed a high arch, like Virginia's natural bridge, and warningly waving his bannered flukes in the air, the Grand God revealed himself, sounded, and went out of sight. Hoveringly halting, and dipping on the wing, the white sea fowls longingly lingered over the agitated pool that he left. With oars a peak, and paddles down, the sheets of their sails adrift, the three boats now stilly floated, awaiting Moby Dick's reappearance. An hour, said Ahab, standing rooted in his boat's stern, and he gazed beyond the whale's place, towards the dim blue spaces and wide wooing vacancies to leeward. It was only an instant, for again his eyes seemed whirling round in his head as he swept the watery circle. The breeze now freshened, the sea began to swell. The birds, the birds, cried Tash Tigo. In long Indian file, as when herons take wing, the white birds were now all flying towards Ahab's boat, and when within a few yards began fluttering over the water there, wheeling round and round, with joyous, expectant cries. Their vision was keener than man's, Ahab could discover no sign in the sea. But suddenly as he peered down and down into its depths, he profoundly saw a white living spot no bigger than a white weasel, with wonderful celerity uprising, and magnifying as it rose, till it turned, and then there were plainly revealed two long crooked rows of white, glistening teeth, floating up from the undiscoverable bottom. It was Moby Dick's open mouth and scrolled jaw, his vast, shadowed bulk still half blending with the blue of the sea. The glittering mouth yawned beneath the boat like an open-doored marble tomb, and giving one sidelong sweep with his steering oar, Ahab whirled the craft aside from this tremendous apparition. Then, calling upon Fidala to change places with him, went forward to the bows, and seizing Perth's harpoon, commanded his crew to grasp their oars and stand by to stern. Now, by reason of this timely spinning round the boat upon its axis, its bow, by anticipation, was made to face the whale's head while yet under water. But as if perceiving this stratagem, Moby Dick, with that malicious intelligence ascribed to him, sidelingly transplanted himself, as it were, in an instant, shooting his pleated head lengthwise beneath the boat. Through and through, through every plank and each rib, it thrilled for an instant, the whale obliquely lying on his back in the manner of a biting shark, slowly and feelingly taking its bows full within his mouth, so that the long, narrow, scrolled lower jaw curled high up into the open air, and one of the teeth caught in a roll lock. The bluish pearl white of the inside of the jaw was within six inches of Ahab's head, and reached higher than that. In this attitude the white whale now shook the slight cedar as a mildly cruel cat her mouse. With Una's tonished eyes Fidala gazed, and crossed his arms, but the tiger-yellow crew were tumbling over each other's heads to gain the uttermost stern. And now, while both elastic gunnels were springing in and out, as the whale dallied with the doomed craft in this devilish way, and from his body being submerged beneath the boat, he could not be darted at from the bows, for the bows were almost inside of him, as it were, and while the other boats involuntarily paused, as before a quick crisis impossible to withstand, then it was that monomaniac Ahab, furious with this tantalizing vicinity of his foe, 
which placed him all alive and helpless in the very jaws he hated, frenzied with all this, he seized the long bone with his naked hands, and wildly strove to wrench it from its gripe. As now he thus vainly strove, the jaw slipped from him, the frail gunnels bent in, collapsed, and snapped, as both jaws, like an enormous shears, sliding further aft, bit the craft completely in twain, and locked themselves fast again in the sea, midway between the two floating wrecks. These floated aside, the broken ends drooping, the crew at the stern wreck clinging to the gunnels, and striving to hold fast to the oars to lash them across. At that preluding moment, ere the boat was yet snapped, Ahab, the first to perceive the whale's intent, by the crafty upraising of his head, a movement that loosed his hold for the time, at that moment his hand had made one final effort to push the boat out of the bight. But only slipping further into the whale's mouth, and tilting over sideways as it slipped, the boat had shaken off his hold on the jaw, spilled him out of it, as he leaned to the push, and so he fell flat-faced upon the sea. Ripplingly withdrawing from his prey, Moby Dick now lay at a little distance, vertically thrusting his oblong white head up and down in the billows, and at the same time slowly revolving his whole spindled body, so that when his vast wrinkled forehead rose some twenty or more feet out of the water the now rising swells, with all their confluent waves, dazzlingly broke against it, vindicatively tossing their shivered spray still higher into the air. So, in a gale, the but half-baffled channel billows only recoil from the base of the eddy stone, triumphantly to overleap its summit with their scud. This motion is peculiar to the sperm whale. It receives its designation, pitch pulling, from its being likened to that preliminary up and down poise of the whale lance, in the exercise called pitch pulling, previously described. By this motion the whale must best and most comprehensively view whatever objects may be encircling him. But soon resuming his horizontal attitude, Moby Dick swam swiftly round and round the wrecked crew, sideways churning the water in his vengeful wake, as if lashing himself up to still another and more deadly assault. The sight of the splintered boat seemed to madden him, as the blood of grapes and mulberries cast before Antiochus's elephants in the Book of Maccabees. Meanwhile Ahab half smothered in the foam of the whale's insolent tail, and too much of a cripple to swim though he could still keep afloat, even in the heart of such a whirlpool as that, helpless Ahab's head was seen, like a tossed bubble which the least chance shock might burst. From the boat's fragmentary stern, Fidala incuriously and mildly eyed him, the clinging crew, at the other drifting end, could not succor him, more than enough was it for them to look to themselves. For so revolvingly appalling was the white whale's aspect, and so planetarily swift the ever-contracting circles he made, that he seemed horizontally swooping upon them. And though the other boats, unharmed, still hovered hard by, still they dared not pull into the eddy to strike, lest that should be the signal for the instant destruction of the jeopardized castaways, Ahab, and all nor in that case could they themselves hope to escape. With straining eyes, then, they remained on the outer edge of the direful zone, whose center had now become the old man's head. Meantime, from the beginning all this had been descried from the ship's mastheads, and squaring her yards, she had borne down upon the scene, and was now so nigh, that Ahab in the water hailed her sail on the but that moment a breaking sea dashed on him from Moby Dick, and whelmed him for the time. But struggling out of it again, and chancing to rise on a towering crest, he shouted sail on the whale, drive him off. The Pequod's prows were pointed, and breaking up the charmed circle, she effectually parted the white whale from his victim. As he sullenly swam off, the boats flew to the rescue, Dragged into Stubb's boat with bloodshot, blinded eyes, the white brine caking in his wrinkles, the long tension of Ahab's bodily strength did crack, and helplessly he yielded to his body's doom, for a time, lying all crushed in the bottom of Stubb's boat, like one trodden underfoot of herds of elephants. Far inland, nameless whales came from him, 
as desolate sounds from out ravines. But this intensity of his physical prostration did but so much the more abbreviate it. In an instant's compass, great hearts sometimes condense to one deep pang, the sum total of those shallow pains kindly diffused through feebler men's whole lives. And so, such hearts, though summary in each one suffering, still, if the gods decree it, in their lifetime aggregate a whole age of woe, wholly made up of instantaneous intensities, for even in their pointless centers, those noble natures contain the entire circumferences of inferior souls. The harpoon, said Ahab, halfway rising, and draggingly leaning on one bended arm is it safe? I, sir, for it was not darted, this is it, said Stubb, showing it. Lay it before me, any missing men. One, two, three, four, five, there were five oars, sir, and here are five men. That's good help me, man, I wish to stand. So, so, I see him. There, there. Going to leeward still, what a leaping spout, hands off from me. The eternal sap runs up in Ahab's bones again. Set the sail, out oars, the helm. It is often the case that when a boat is stove, its crew, being picked up by another boat, help to work that second boat, and the chase is thus continued with what is called double banked oars. It was thus now. But the added power of the boat did not equal the added power of the whale, for he seemed to have treble banked his every fin, swimming with a velocity which plainly showed, that if now, under these circumstances, pushed on, the chase would prove an indefinitely prolonged, if not a hopeless one, nor could any crew endure for so long a period, such an unintermitted, intense straining at the oar, a thing barely tolerable only in some one brief vicissitude. The ship itself, then, as it sometimes happens, offered the most promising intermediate means of overtaking the chase. Accordingly, the boats now made for her, and were soon swayed up to their cranes the two parts of the wrecked boat having been previously secured by her and then hoisting everything to her side, and stacking her canvas high up, and sideways outstretching it with stun sails, like the double-jointed wings of an albatross, the Pequod bore down in the leeward wake of Moby Dick. At the well-known, methodic intervals, the whale's glittering spout was regularly announced from the manned mast heads, and when he would be reported as just gone down, Ahab would take the time, and then pacing the deck, binnacle watch in hand, so soon as the last second of the allotted hour expired, his voice was heard whose is the doubloon now? Do ye see him? And if the reply was, no, sir. Straightway he commanded them to lift him to his perch. In this way the day wore on, Ahab, now aloft and motionless, anon, unrestingly pacing the planks. As he was thus walking, uttering no sound, except to hail the men aloft, or to bid them hoist a sail still higher, or to spread one to a still greater breadth thus to and fro pacing, beneath his slouched hat, at every turn he passed his own wrecked boat, which had been dropped upon the quarter deck, and lay there reversed, broken bow to shattered stern. At last he paused before it, and as in an already overclouded sky fresh troops of clouds will sometimes sail across, so over the old man's face there now stole some such added gloom as this. Stubb saw him pause, and perhaps intending, not vainly, though, to evince his own unabated fortitude, and thus keep up a valiant place in his captain's mind, he advanced, and eyeing the wreck exclaimed the thistle the ass refused, it pricked his mouth too keenly, sir, ha, ha. What soulless thing is this that laughs before a wreck? Man, man. Did I not know thee brave as fearless fire, and as mechanical, I could swear thou wert a poltroon groan nor laugh should be heard before a wreck. I, sir, said Starbuck drawing near, tis a solemn sight, an omen, and an ill one. Omen, omen, the dictionary. If the gods think to speak outright to man, 
they will honorably speak outright, not shake their heads, and give an old wife's darkling hint begone. Yet two are the opposite poles of one thing, Starbuck is Stub reversed, and Stub is Starbuck, and yet two are all mankind, and Ahab stands alone among the millions of the peopled earth, nor gods, nor men his neighbors. Cold, cold I shiver, how now? Aloft there. Do ye see him? Sing out for every spout, though he spout ten times a second. The day was nearly done, only the hem of his golden robe was rustling. Soon, it was almost dark, but the lookout men still remained unset. Can't see the spout now, sir, too dark, cried a voice from the air. How heading when last seen? As before, sir straight to leeward. Good, he will travel slower now it is night. Down royals and top gallant stun sails, Mr. Starbuck. We must not run over him before morning, he's making a passage now, and may heave to a while. Helm there. Keep her full before the wind, aloft. Come down, Mr. Stubb, send a fresh hand to the foremast head, and see it manned till morning. Then advancing towards the doubloon in the mainmast men, this gold is mine, for I earned it, but I shall let it abide here till the white whale is dead, and then, whosoever of ye first raises him, upon the day he shall be killed, this gold is that man's and if on that day I shall again raise him, then, ten times its sum shall be divided among all of ye. Away now, the deck is thine, sir. And so saying, he placed himself halfway within the scuttle, and slouching his hat, stood there till dawn, except when at intervals rousing himself to see how the night wore on. Chapter 134 The Chase Second Day at daybreak, the three mastheads were punctually manned afresh. Do ye see him? cried Ahab after allowing a little space for the light to spread. See nothing, sir. Turn up all hands and make sail, he travels faster than I thought for, the top gallant sails, I, they should have been kept on her all night. But no matter tis but resting for the rush. Here be it said that this pertinacious pursuit of one particular whale, continued through day into night, and through night into day, is a thing by no means unprecedented in the South Sea fishery. For such is the wonderful skill, prescience of experience, and invincible confidence acquired by some great natural geniuses among the Nantucket commanders, that from the simple observation of a whale when last descried, they will, under certain given circumstances, pretty accurately foretell both the direction in which he will continue to swim for a time, while out of sight, as well as his probable rate of progression during that period. And, in these cases, somewhat as a pilot, when about losing sight of a coast, whose general trending he well knows, and which he desires shortly to return to again, but at some further point, like as this pilot stands by his compass, and takes the precise bearing of the cape at present visible, in order the more certainly to hit aright the remote, unseen headland, eventually to be visited, so does the fisherman, at his compass, with the whale, for after being chased, and diligently marked. Through several hours of daylight, then, when night obscures the fish, the creature's future wake through the darkness is almost as established to the sagacious mind of the hunter, as the pilot's coast is to him. So that to this hunter's wondrous skill, the proverbial evanescence of a thing writ in water, awake, is to all desired purposes well nigh as reliable as the steadfast land. And as the mighty iron leviathan of the modern railway is so familiarly known in its every pace, that, with watches in their hands, men time his rate as doctors that of a baby's pulse, and lightly say of it, the up train or the down train will reach such or such a spot, at such or such an hour, even so, almost, there are occasions when these Nantucketers time that other leviathan of the deep, according to the observed humor of his speed, and say to themselves, so many hours hence this whale. 
will have gone 200 miles, will have about reached this or that degree of latitude or longitude. But to render this acuteness at all successful in the end, the wind and the sea must be the whaleman's allies, for of what present avail to the becalmed or wind-bound mariner is the skill that assures him he is exactly 93 leagues and a quarter from his port. Inferable from these statements, are many collateral subtle matters touching the chase of whales. The ship tore on, leaving such a furrow in the sea as when a cannonball, missent, becomes a plowshare and turns up the level field. By salt and hemp, cried Stubb, but this swift motion of the deck creeps up one's legs and tingles at the heart. This ship and I are two brave fellows, ha, ha. Someone take me up, and launch me, spine-wise, on the sea for by live oaks. My spine's a keel. Ha, ha. We go the gate that leaves no dust behind. There she blows she blows, she blows, right ahead, was now the masthead cry. I, I, cried Stubb, I knew it ya can't escape blow on and split your spout, a oh whale, the mad fiend himself is after yet, blow your trump blister your lungs, Ahab will dam off your blood, as a miller shuts his water gate upon the stream. And Stubb did but speak out for well nigh all that crew. The frenzies of the chase had by this time worked them bubblingly up, like old wine worked anew. Whatever pale fears and forebodings some of them might have felt before, these were not only now kept out of sight through the growing awe of Ahab, but they were broken up, and on all sides rooted, as timid prairie hares that scatter before the bounding bison. The hand of fate had snatched all their souls, and by the stirring perils of the previous day, the rack of the past night's suspense, the fixed, unfearing, blind, reckless way in which their wild craft went plunging towards its flying mark, by all these things, their hearts were bowled along. The wind that made great bellies of their sails, and rushed the vessel on by arms invisible as irresistible, this seemed the symbol of that unseen agency which so enslaved them to the race. They were one man, not thirty. For as the one ship that held them all, though it was put together of all contrasting things oak and maple and pine wood, iron and pitch and hemp yet all these ran into each other in the one concrete hull, which shot on its way, both balanced and directed by the long central keel, even so, all the individualities of the crew, this man's valor, that man's fear, guilt and guiltiness, all varieties were welded into oneness, and were all directed to that fatal goal which they have their one lord end. Keel did point to. The rigging lived. The mast heads, like the tops of tall palms, were outspreadingly tufted with arms and legs. Clinging to a spar with one hand, some reached forth the other with impatient wavings, others, shading their eyes from the vivid sunlight, sat far out on the rocking yards, all the spars in full bearing of mortals, ready and ripe for their fate. Ah! How they still strove through that infinite blueness to seek out the thing that might destroy them. Why sing ye not out for him, if ye see him, cried Ahab, when, after the lapse of some minutes since the first cry, no more had been heard. Sway me up, men, ye have been deceived, not Moby Dick casts one odd jet that way, and then disappears. It was even so, in their headlong eagerness, the men had mistaken some other thing for the whale spout, as the event itself soon proved, for hardly had Ahab reached his perch, hardly was the rope belayed to its pin on deck, when he struck the keynote to an orchestra, that made the air vibrate as with the combined discharges of rifles. The triumphant halloo of thirty buckskin lungs was heard, as much nearer to the ship than the place of the imaginary jet, less than a mile ahead Moby Dick bodily burst into view. For not by any calm and indolent spoutings, not by the peaceable gush of that mystic fountain in his head, did the white whale now reveal his vicinity, but by the far more wondrous phenomenon of breaching. Rising with his utmost velocity from the furthest depths, the sperm whale thus booms his entire bulk into the pure element of air, and piling up a mountain of dazzling foam, 
shows his place to the distance of seven miles and more. In those moments, the torn, enraged waves he shakes off, seem his mane, in some cases, this breaching is his act of defiance. There she breaches, there she breaches, was the cry, as in his immeasurable bravados the white whale tossed himself salmon-like to heaven. So suddenly seen in the blue plain of the sea, and relieved against the still bluer margin of the sky, the spray that he raised, for the moment, intolerably glittered and glared like a glacier, and stood there gradually fading and fading away from its first sparkling intensity, to the dim mistiness of an advancing shower in a veil. I, breach your last to the sun, Moby Dick, cried Ahab, thy hour and thy harpoon are at hand, down, down all of yet, but one man at the fore. The boats, stand by. Unmindful of the tedious rope ladders of the shrouds, the men, like shooting stars, slid to the deck, by the isolated backstays and halyards, while Ahab, less dartingly, but still rapidly was dropped from his perch. Lower away, he cried, so soon as he had reached his boat a spare one, rigged the afternoon previous. Mr. Starbuck, the ship is thine keep away from the boats, but keep near them. Lower, all. As if to strike a quick terror into them, by this time being the first assailant himself, Moby Dick had turned, and was now coming for the three crews. Ahab's boat was central, and cheering his men, he told them he would take the whale head and head that is, pull straight up to his forehead a not uncommon thing, for when within a certain limit, such a course excludes the coming onset from the whale's sidelong vision. But ere that close limit was gained, and while yet all three boats were plain as the ship's three masts to his eye, the white whale churning himself into furious speed, almost in an instant as it were, rushing among the boats with open jaws, and a lashing tail, offered appalling battle on every side, and heedless of the irons darted at him from every boat, seemed only intent on annihilating each separate plank of which those boats were made. But skillfully maneuvered, incessantly wheeling like trained chargers in the field, the boats for a while eluded him, though, at times, but by a plank's breadth, while all the time, Ahab's unearthly slogan tore every other cry but his to shreds. But at last in his untraceable evolutions, the white whale so crossed and recrossed, and in a thousand ways entangled the slack of the three lines now fast to him, that they foreshortened, and, of themselves, warped the devoted boats towards the planted irons in him, though now for a moment the whale drew aside a little, as if to rally for a more tremendous charge. Seizing that opportunity, Ahab first paid out more line, and then was rapidly hauling and jerking in upon it again hoping that way to disencumber it of some snarls when lo, a sight more savage than the embattled teeth of sharks. Caught and twisted corkscrewed in the mazes of the line, loose harpoons and lances, with all their bristling barbs and points, came flashing and dripping up to the chocks in the bows of Ahab's boat. Only one thing could be done. Seizing the boat knife, he critically reached within through and then, without the rays of steel, dragged. In the line beyond, passed it, inboard, to the bowsman, and then, twice sundering the rope near the chocks dropped the intercepted faggot of steel into the sea, and was all fast again. That instant, the white whale made a sudden rush among the remaining tangles of the other lines, by so doing, irresistibly dragged the more involved boats of stub and flask towards his flukes, dashed them together like two rolling husks on a surf-beaten beach, and then, diving down into the sea, disappeared in a boiling maelstrom, in which, for a space, the odorous cedar chips of the wrecks danced round and round, like the grated nutmeg in a swiftly stirred bowl of punch. While the two crews were yet circling in the waters, reaching out after the revolving line tubs, oars, and other floating furniture, while a slope little flask bobbed up and down like an empty vial, twitching his legs upwards to escape the dreaded jaws of sharks, and Stubb was lustily singing out for someone to ladle him up, 
and while the old man's line now parting admitted of his pulling into the creamy pool to rescue whom he could, in that wild simultaneousness of a thousand concreted perils. Ahab's yet unstricken boat seemed drawn up towards heaven by invisible wires as, arrow-like, shooting perpendicularly from the sea, the white whale dashed his broad forehead against its bottom, and sent it, turning over and over, into the air, till it fell again gunwale downwards and Ahab and his men struggled out from under it, like seals from a seaside cave. The first uprising momentum of the whale modifying its direction as he struck the surface involuntarily launched him along it, to a little distance from the center of the destruction he had made, and with his back to it, he now lay for a moment slowly feeling with his flukes from side to side, and whenever a stray or bit of plank, the least chip or crumb of the boats touched his skin, his tail swiftly drew back, and came sideways smiting the sea. But soon, as if satisfied that his work for that time was done, he pushed his pleated forehead through the ocean, and trailing after him the intertangled lines, continued his leeward way at a traveler's methodic pace. As before, the attentive ship having described the whole fight, again came bearing down to the rescue, and dropping a boat, picked up the floating mariners, tubs, oars, and whatever else could be caught at, and safely landed them on her decks. Some sprained shoulders, wrists, and ankles, livid contusions, wrenched harpoons and lances, inextricable intricacies of rope, shattered oars and planks, all these were there, but no fatal or even serious ill seemed to have befallen anyone. As with Fidala the day before, so Ahab was now found grimly clinging to his boat's broken half, which afforded a comparatively easy float, nor did it so exhaust him as the previous day's mishap. But when he was helped to the deck, all eyes were fastened upon him, as instead of standing by himself he still half hung upon the shoulder of Starbuck, who had thus far been the foremost to assist him. His ivory leg had been snapped off, leaving but one short sharp splinter, I, I, Starbuck, tis sweet to lean sometimes, be the leaner who he will, and would old Ahab had leaned oftener than he has. The feral has not stood, sir, said the carpenter, now coming up, I put good work into that leg. But no bones broken, sir, I hope, said Stubb with true concern. I, and all splintered to pieces, Stubb. Do ye see it but even with a broken bone, old Ahab is untouched, and I account no living bone of mine one jot more me, than this dead one that's lost. Nor white whale, nor man, nor fiend, can so much as graze old Ahab in his own proper and inaccessible being. Can any lead touch yonder floor, any mast scrape yonder roof, aloft there? Which way? Dead to leeward, sir. Up helm, then, pile on the sail again, ship keepers, down the rest of the spare boats and rig them Mr. Starbuck away, and muster the boat's crews. Let me first help thee towards the bulwarks, sir. Oh, 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 how this splinter gores me now. A cursed fate. That the unconquerable captain in the soul should have such a craven mate. Sir. My body man, not thee. Give me something for a cane there, that shivered lance will do. Muster the men. Surely I have not seen him yet. By heaven it cannot be, missing, quick. Call them all. The old man's hinted thought was true. Upon mustering the company, the Parsi was not there. The Parsi, cried Stubb he must have been caught in. The black vomit wrench thee, run all of ye above, alow, cabin, folks'll find him not gone not gone. But quickly they returned to him with the tidings that the Parsi was nowhere to be found. I, sir, said Stubb caught among the tangles of your line I thought I saw him dragging under. My line, my line? Gone, gone? What means that little word, what death knell rings in it? that old Ahab shakes as if he were the belfry. The harpoon, too, toss over the litter there do ye see it, 
the forged iron, men, the white whales no, no, no blistered fool. This hand did dart it, tis in the fish, aloft there. Keep him nailed quick, all hands to the rigging of the boats collect the oars harpa one oars. The irons, the irons, hoist the royals hire a pull on all the sheets, helm there. Steady, steady for your life. I'll ten times girdle the unmeasured globe, yet and dive straight through it, but I'll slay him yet. Great God, but for one single instant show thyself, cried Starbuck, never, never wilt thou capture him, old man in Jesus' name no more of this, that's worse than devil's madness. Two days chased, twice stove to splinters, thy very leg once more snatched from under thee, thy evil shadow gone all good angels mobbing thee with warnings what more wouldst thou have, shall we keep chasing this murderous fish till he swamps the last man? Shall we be dragged by him to the bottom of the sea? Shall we be towed by him to the infernal world? Oh, oh impiety and blasphemy to hunt him more. Starbuck, of late I've felt strangely moved to thee, ever since that hour we both saw thou knowest what, in one another's eyes. But in this matter of the whale, be the front of thy face to me as the palm of this hand a lipless, unfeatured blank. Ahab is forever Ahab, man. This whole acts immutably decreed. Twas rehearsed by thee and me a billion years before this ocean rolled. Fool. I am the fate's lieutenant, I act under orders. Look thou, underling. That thou obeyest mine stand round me, men. Yes see an old man cut down to the stump, leaning on a shivered lance, propped up on a lonely foot. Tis Ahab his body's part, but Ahab's soul's a centipede, that moves upon a hundred legs. I feel strained, half stranded, as ropes that tow dismasted frigates in a gale, and I may look so. But ere I break, yell hear me crack, until ye hear that, know that Ahab's hawser tows his purpose yet. Believe yet, men, in the things called omens. Then laugh aloud, and cry encore. For ere they drown, drowning things will twice rise to the surface, then rise again, to sink forevermore. So with Moby Dick two days he's floated tomorrow will be the third. I, men, he'll rise once more but only to spout his last. Do ye feel brave men, brave? As fearless fire, cried Stubb. And as mechanical, muttered Ahab. Then as the men went forward, he muttered on, the things called omens. And yesterday I talked the same to Starbuck there, concerning my broken boat. Oh! How valiantly I seek to drive out of others' hearts what's clinched so fast in mine, the Parsi the Parsi, gone, gone? And he was to go before but still was to be seen again ere I could perish house that. There's a riddle now might baffle all the lawyers backed by the ghosts of the whole line of judges like a hawk's beak it pecks my brain. I'll, I'll solve it, though. When dusk descended, the whale was still in sight to leeward. So once more the sail was shortened, and everything passed nearly as on the previous night, only, the sound of hammers, and the hum of the grindstone was heard till nearly daylight as the men toiled by lanterns in the complete and careful rigging of the spare boats and sharpening their fresh weapons for the morrow. Meantime, of the broken keel of Ahab's wrecked craft the carpenter made him another leg, while still as on the night before, slouched Ahab stood fixed within his scuttle, his head, heliotrope glance anticipatingly gone backward on its dial, sat due eastward for the earliest sun. Chapter 135 The Chase Third Day The morning of the third day dawned fair and fresh, and once more the solitary night man at the foremast head was relieved by crowds of the daylight lookouts, who dotted every mast and almost every spar. Do ye see him? cried Ahab, but the whale was not yet in sight. In his infallible wake, though, but follow that wake, that's all. Helm there, steady, as thou goest, 
and hast been going. What a lovely day again! Were it a new-made world, and made for a summer house to the angels, and this morning the first of its throwing open to them, a fairer day could not dawn upon that world. Here's food for thought, had Ahab time to think, but Ahab never thinks, he only feels, 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 that's tingling enough for mortal man. To think's audacity. God only has that right and privilege. Thinking is, or ought to be, a coolness and a calmness, and our poor hearts throb, and our poor brains beat too much for that. And yet, I've sometimes thought my brain was very calm frozen calm, this old skull cracks so, like a glass in which the contents turn to ice, and shiver it. And still this hair is growing now, this moment growing, and heat must breed it, but no, it's like that sort of common grass that will grow anywhere, between the earthy clefts of Greenland ice or in Vesuvius lava. How the wild winds blow it, they whip it about me as the torn shreds of split sails lash the tossed ship they cling to. A vile wind that has no doubt blown air this through prison corridors and cells, and wards of hospitals, and ventilated them, and now comes blowing hither as innocent as fleeces. Out upon it, it's tainted. Were I the wind, I'd blow no more on such a wicked, miserable world. I'd crawl somewhere to a cave, and slink there. And yet, tis a noble and heroic thing, the wind. Whoever conquered it. In every fight it has the last and bitterest blow. Run tilting at it, and you but run through it. Ha! A coward wind that strikes stark naked men, but will not stand to receive a single blow. Even Ahab is a braver thing a nobler thing than that. Would now the wind but had a body, but all the things that most exasperate and outrage mortal man, all these things are bodiless, but only bodiless as objects, not as agents. There's a most special, a most cunning, oh, a most malicious difference. And yet, I say again, and swear it now, that there's something all glorious and gracious in the wind. These warm trade winds, at least, that in the clear heavens blow straight on, in strong and steadfast, vigorous mildness, and veer not from their mark, however the baser currents of the sea may turn and tack, and mightiest Mississippis of the land swift and swerve about, uncertain where to go at last. And by the eternal poles. These same trades that so directly blow my good ship on, these trades, or something like them something so unchangeable, and full as strong, blow my keeled soul along. To it. Aloft there. What do ye see? Nothing, sir. Nothing, and noon at hand. The doubloon goes a begging. See the sun. I, I, it must be so. I've oversailed him. How, got the start. I, He's chasing me now, not I, him that's bad, I might have known it, too. Fool. The line's the harpoons he's towing. I, I, I have run him by last night. About. About. Come down, all of yet, but the regular lookouts. Man the braces. Steering as she had done, the wind had been somewhat on the Pequod's quarter, so that now being pointed in the reverse direction, the braced ship sailed hard upon the breeze as she retchened the cream in her own white wake. Against the wind he now steers for the open jaw, murmured Starbuck to himself, as he coiled the new hauled main brace upon the rail. God keep us, but already my bones feel damp within me, and from the inside wet my flesh. I misdoubt me that I disobey my God in obeying him. Stand by to sway me up, cried Ahab, advancing to the hempen basket. We should meet him soon. I, I, sir, and straightway Starbuck did Ahab's bidding, and once more Ahab swung on high. A whole hour now passed, gold beaten out to ages. Time itself now held long breaths with keen suspense. But at last, some three points off the weather bow, 
Ahab descried the spout again, and instantly from the three mastheads three shrieks went up as if the tongues of fire had voiced it. Forward to forward I meet thee, this third time, Moby Dick. On deck there, brace sharper up, crowd her into the wind's eye. He's too far off to lower yet, Mr. Starbuck. The sails shake. Stand over that helmsman with a top maul. So, so, he travels fast, and I must down. But let me have one more good round look aloft here at the sea, there's time for that. An old, old sight, and yet somehow so young, I, and not changed a wink since I first saw it, a boy, from the sand hills of Nantucket. The same, the same, the same to Noah as to me. There's a soft shower to leeward. Such lovely leewardings. They must lead somewhere to something else than common land, more palmy than the palms. Leeward. The white whale goes that way, look to windward, then, the better if the bitterer quarter. But goodbye, goodbye, old masthead. What's this, green? I, tiny mosses in these warped cracks. No such green weather stains on Ahab's head. There's the difference now between man's old age and matters. But I, old mast, we both grow old together, sound in our hulls, though, are we not, my ship? I, minus a leg, that's all. By heaven this dead wood has the better of my life flesh every way. I can't compare with it, and I've known some ships made of dead trees outlast the lives of men made of the most vital stuff of vital fathers. What's that he said? He should still go before me, my pilot, and yet to be seen again? But where? Will I have eyes at the bottom of the sea, supposing I descend those endless stairs? And all night I've been sailing from him, wherever he did sink to. I, I, like many more thou told st direful truth as touching thyself, O Parsi, but, Ahab, there thy shot fell short. Goodbye, masthead keep a good eye upon the whale, the while I'm gone. We'll talk tomorrow, nay, tonight, when the white whale lies down there, tied by head and tail. He gave the word, and still gazing round him, was steadily lowered through the cloven blue air to the deck. In due time the boats were lowered, but as standing in his shallop's stern, Ahab just hovered upon the point of the descent, he waved to the mate who held one of the tackle ropes on deck and bade him pause. Starbuck. Sir. For the third time my soul's ship starts upon this voyage, Starbuck. I, sir, thou wilt have it so. Some ships sail from their ports, and ever afterwards are missing, Starbuck. Truth, sir, saddest truth. Some men die at ebb tide, some at low water, some at the full of the flood, and I feel now like a billow that's all one crested comb, Starbuck. I am old, shake hands with me, man. Their hands met, their eyes fastened, Starbucks tears the glue. Oh, my captain, my captain, noble heart go not go not, see, it's a brave man that weeps. How great the agony of the persuasion then! Lower away! Cried Ahab, tossing the mate's arm from him. Stand by the crew! In an instant the boat was pulling round close under the stern. The sharks, the sharks, cried a voice from the low cabin window there, O oh master, my master, come back! But Ahab heard nothing, for his own voice was high lifted then and the boat leaped on. Yet the voice spake true, for scarce had he pushed from the ship, when numbers of sharks, seemingly rising from out the dark waters beneath the hull, maliciously snapped at the blades of the oars, every time they dipped in the water, and in this way accompanied the boat with their bites. It is a thing not uncommonly happening to the whaleboats in those swarming seas, the sharks at times apparently following them in the same prescient way that vultures hover over the banners of marching regiments in the east. 
But these were the first sharks that had been observed by the Pequod since the white whale had been first descried, and whether it was that Ahab's crew were all such tiger yellow barbarians, and therefore their flesh more musky to the senses of the sharks a matter sometimes well known to affect them however it was, they seemed to follow that one boat without molesting the others. Heart of wrought steel, murmured Starbuck gazing over the side, and following with his eyes the receding boat canst thou yet ring boldly to that sight, lowering thy keel among ravening sharks, and followed by them, open mouthed to the chase, and this the critical third day, for when three days flow together in one continuous intense pursuit, be sure the first is the morning, the second the noon, and the third the evening and the end of that thing be that end what it may. Oh! My God! What is this that shoots through me, and leaves me so deadly calm, yet expectant fixed at the top of a shutter? Future things swim before me, as in empty outlines and skeletons, all the past is somehow grown dim. Mary, girl, thou fadest in pale glories behind me, boy. I seem to see but thy eyes grown wondrous blue. Strangest problems of life seem clearing, but clouds sweep between is my journey's end coming? My legs feel faint, like his who has footed it all day. Feel thy heart beats it yet? Stir thyself, Starbuck, stave it off move, move. Speak aloud, masthead there. See ye my boy's hand on the hill, crazed, aloft there, keep thy keenest eye upon the boat's mark well the whale, ho. Again, held on his way a little sideways from the vessel, the beck-armed crew maintaining the profoundest silence, as the head-beat waves hammered and hammered against the opposing bow. Drive, drive in your nails, O oh ye waves, to their uttermost heads drive them in, yet but strike a thing without a lid, and no coffin and no hearse can be mine and hemp only can kill me. Ha! Ha! Suddenly the waters around them slowly swelled in broad circles, then quickly upheaved, as if sideways sliding from a submerged berg of ice, swiftly rising to the surface. A low rumbling sound was heard, a subterraneous hum, and then all held their breaths, as bedraggled with trailing ropes, and harpoons, and lances, a vast form shot lengthwise, but obliquely from the sea. Shrouded in a thin drooping veil of mist, it hovered for a moment in the rainbowed air, and then fell swamping back into the deep. Crushed thirty feet upwards, the waters flashed for an instant like heaps of fountains, then brokenly sank in a shower of flakes, leaving the circling surface creamed like new milk round the marble trunk of the whale. Give way, cried Ahab to the oarsmen, and the boats darted forward to the attack but maddened by yesterday's fresh irons that corroded in him, Moby Dick seemed combinedly possessed by all the angels that fell from heaven. The wide tears of welded tendons overspreading his broad white forehead, beneath the transparent skin, looked knitted together, as head on, he came churning his tail among the boats, and once more flailed them apart, spilling out the irons and lances from the two mates' boats, and dashing in one side of the upper part of their bows, but leaving Ahab's almost without a scar. While Dagu and Queequeg were stopping the strained planks, and as the whale swimming out from them, turned, and showed one entire flank as he shot by them again, at that moment a quick cry went up. Lashed round and round to the fish's back, pinioned in the turns upon turns in which, during the past night, the whale had reeled the involutions of the lines around him, the half-torn body of the Parsi was seen, his sable raiment frayed to shreds, his distended eyes turned full upon old Ahab. The harpoon dropped from his hand. Befold, befold. Drawing in a long lean breath I, Parsi. I see thee again I, and thou goest before, and this, this then is the hearse that thou didst promise. But I hold thee to the last letter of thy word. Where is the second hearse? Away, mates, to the ship. Those boats are useless now, repair them if ye can in time, and return to me, if not, Ahab is enough to die down, men. 
The first thing that but offers to jump from this boat I stand in, that thing I harpoon. Ye are not other men, but my arms and my legs, and so obey me where's the whale? Gone down again. But he looked too nigh the boat, for as if bent upon escaping with the corpse he bore, and as if the particular place of the last encounter had been but a stage in his leeward voyage, Moby Dick was now again steadily swimming forward, and had almost passed the ship which thus far had been sailing in the contrary direction to him, though for the present her headway had been stopped. He seemed swimming with his utmost velocity, and now only intent upon pursuing his own straight path in the sea. Oh! Ahab, cried Starbuck, not too late is it, even now, the third day, to desist. See! Moby Dick seeks thee not. It is thou, thou, that madly seekest him. Setting sail to the rising wind, the lonely boat was swiftly impelled to leeward, by both oars and canvas. And at last when Ahab was sliding by the vessel, so near as plainly to distinguish Starbuck's face as he leaned over the rail, he hailed him to turn the vessel about, and follow him, not too swiftly, at a judicious interval. Glancing upwards, he saw Tash Tigo, Queequeg, and Dagu, eagerly mounting to the three mast heads, while the oarsmen were rocking in the two staved boats which had but just been hoisted to the side and were busily at work in repairing them. One after the other, through the portholes, as he sped, he also caught flying glimpses of stub and flask, busying themselves on deck among bundles of new irons and lances. As he saw all this, as he heard the hammers in the broken boats, far other hammers seemed driving a nail into his heart. But he rallied. And now marking that the vane or flag was gone from the mainmast head, he shouted to Tash Tigo, who had just gained that perch, to descend again for another flag, and a hammer and nails, and so nail it to the mast. Whether faggied by the three days running chase, and the resistance to his swimming in the knotted hamper he bore, or whether it was some latent deceitfulness and malice in him, whichever was true, the white whale's way now began to abate, as it seemed, from the boat so rapidly nearing him once more though indeed the whale's last start had not been so long a one as before. And still as Ahab glided over the waves the unpitying sharks accompanied him, and so pertinaciously stuck to the boat, and so continually bit at the plying oars, that the blades became jagged and crunched, and left small splinters in the sea, at almost every dip. Heed them not, those teeth but give new rowlocks to your oars. Pull on. Tis the better rest, the shark's jaw than the yielding water. But at every bite, sir, the thin blades grow smaller and smaller. They will last long enough, pull on, but who can tell he muttered whether these sharks swim to feast on the whale or on Ahab, but pull on. I, all alive, now we near him. The helm. Take the helm. Let me pass and so saying two of the oarsmen helped him forward to the bows of the still flying boat. At length as the craft was cast to one side, and ran ranging along with the white whale's flank, he seemed strangely oblivious of its advance as the whale sometimes will and Ahab was fairly within the smoky mountain mist, which, thrown off from the whale's spout, curled round his great, monadnock hump, he was even thus close to him, when, with body arched back, and both arms lengthwise high lifted to the poise, he darted his fierce iron, and his far fiercer curse into the hated whale. As both steel and curse sank to the socket, as if sucked into a morass, Moby Dick sideways writhed, spasmodically rolled his knife flank against the bow, and, without staving a hole in it, so suddenly canted the boat over, that had it not been for the elevated part of the gunwale to which he then clung, Ahab would once more have been tossed into the sea. As it was, three of the oarsmen who foreknew not the precise instant of the dart, and were therefore unprepared for its effects these were flung out, but so fell, that, in an instant two of them clutched the gunwale again, and rising to its level on a combing wave, hurled themselves bodily inboard again, the third man helplessly dropping astern, 
but still afloat and swimming. Almost simultaneously, with the mighty volition of ungraduated, instantaneous swiftness, the white whale darted through the weltering sea. But when Ahab cried out to the steersman to take new turns with the line, and hold it so, and commanded the crew to turn round on their seats, and tow the boat up to the mark, the moment the treacherous line felt that double strain and tug, it snapped in the empty air. What breaks in me? Some sinew cracks, tis whole again, oars. Oars. Burst in upon him. Hearing the tremendous rush of the sea crashing boat, the whale wheeled round to present his blank forehead at bay, but in that evolution, catching sight of the nearing black hull of the ship, seemingly seeing in it the source of all his persecutions, bethinking it it may be a larger and nobler foe, of a sudden, he bore down upon its advancing prow, smiting his jaws amid fiery showers of foam. Ahab staggered, his hand smote his forehead. I grow blind, hands, stretch out before me that I may yet grope my way. Eyes T night. The whale. The ship cried the cringing oarsman. Oars, oars. Slope downwards to thy depths, O sea, that ere it be forever too late, Ahab may slide this last, last time upon his mark. I see, the ship. The ship. Dash on, my men. Will ye not save my ship? But as the oarsmen violently forced their boat through the sledge-hammering seas, the before whale smitten bow ends of two planks burst through, and in an instant almost, the temporarily disabled boat lay nearly level with the waves, its half waiting, splashing crew, trying hard to stop the gap and bail out the pouring water. Meantime, for that one beholding instant, Tashtego's masthead hammer remained suspended in his hand, and the red flag, half wrapping him as with a plaid, then streamed itself straight out from him, as his own forward flowing heart, while Starbuck and Stubb, standing upon the bowsprit beneath, caught sight of the downcoming monster just as soon as he. The whale, the whale. Up helm, up helm. Oh, all ye sweet powers of air, now hug me close. Let not Starbuck die, if die he must, in a woman's fainting fit. Up helm, I say ye fools, the jaw. The jaw. Is this the end of all my bursting prayers? All my lifelong fidelities? Oh, Ahab, Ahab, lo, thy work. Steady. Helmsman, steady. Nay, nay. Up helm again. He turns to meet us. Oh his unappeasable brow drives on towards one, whose duty tells him he cannot depart. My God, stand by me now. Stand not by me, but stand under me, whoever you are that will now help Stubb, for Stubb, too, sticks here. I grin at thee, thou grinning whale. Whoever helped Stubb, or kept Stubb awake, but Stubb's own unwinking eye, and now poor Stubb goes to bed upon a mattress that is all too soft, would it were stuffed with brushwood. I grin at thee, thou grinning whale. Look yet, sun, moon, and stars. I call ye assassins of as good a fellow as ever spouted up his ghost. For all that, I would yet ring glasses with ye, would ye but hand the cup. Oh, 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 oh. Thou grinning whale, but there'll be plenty of gulping soon. Why fly ye not, O oh Ahab? For me, off shoes and jacket to it, let Stubb die in his drawers. A most moldy and oversalted death, though, cherries. 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 Oh, flask, for one red cherry ere we die. Cherries? I only wish that we were where they grow. Oh, Stubb, I hope my poor mother's drawn my part pay ere this, if not, few coppers will now come to her, for the voyage is up. From the ship's bows, nearly all the seamen now hung inactive, hammers, 
bits of plank, lances, and harpoons, mechanically retained in their hands, just as they had darted from their various employments, all their enchanted eyes intent upon the whale, which from side to side strangely vibrating his predestinating head, sent a broad band of overspreading semicircular foam before him as he rushed. Retribution, swift vengeance, eternal malice were in his whole aspect, and spite of all that mortal man could do, the solid white buttress of his forehead smote the ship's starboard bow till men and timbers reeled. Some fell flat upon their faces. Like dislodged trucks, the heads of the harpa winners aloft shook on their bull-like necks. Through the breach, they heard the waters pour, as mountain torrents down a flume. The ship, the hearse, the second hearse, cried Ahab from the boat, its wood could only be American. Diving beneath the settling ship, the whale ran quivering along its keel, but turning under water, swiftly shot to the surface again, far off the other bow, but within a few yards of Ahab's boat, where, for a time, he lay quiescent. I turn my body from the sun. What ho, Tash Tigo! Let me hear thy hammer. Oh! Ye three unsurrendered spires of mine, thou uncracked keel, and only god bullied hull, thou firm deck, and haughty helm, and pole pointed prow death glorious ship. Must ye then perish, and without me? Am I cut off from the last fond pride of meanest shipwrecked captains? Oh, lonely death on lonely life! Oh, now I feel my topmost greatness lies in my topmost grief. Ho, ho! From all your furthest bounds, pour ye now in, ye bold billows of my whole foregone life, and top this one piled comber of my death. Towards thee I roll, thou all-destroying but unconquering whale, to the last I grapple with thee, from hell's heart I stab at thee, for hate's sake I spit my last breath at thee. Sink all coffins and all hearses to one common pool. And since neither can be mine, let me then tow to pieces, while still chasing thee, though tied to thee, thou damned whale. Thus, I give up the spear. The harpoon was darted, the stricken whale flew forward, with igniting velocity the line ran through the grooves, ran foul. Ahab stooped to clear it, he did clear it, but the flying turn caught him round the neck, and voicelessly as Turkish mutes bowstring their victim, he was shot out of the boat, ere the crew knew he was gone. Next instant, the heavy ice splice in the rope's final end flew out of the stark empty tub, knocked down an oarsman, and smiting the sea, disappeared in its depths. For an instant, the tranced boat's crew stood still, then turned. The ship? Great God, where is the ship? Soon they threw dim, bewildering medium saw her sidelong fading phantom, as in the gaseous Fata Morgana, only the uppermost masts out of water, while fixed by infatuation, or fidelity, or fate, to their once lofty perches, the pagan Harpa Wunner still maintained their sinking lookouts on the sea. And now, concentric circles seized the lone boat itself, and all its crew, and each floating oar, and every lance pole, and spinning, animate and inanimate, all round and round in one vortex, carried the smallest chip of the Pequot out of sight. But as the last whelmings intermixingly poured themselves over the sunken head of the Indian at the mainmast, leaving a few inches of the erect spar yet visible, together with long streaming yards of the flag, which calmly undulated, with ironical coincidings, over the destroying billows they almost touched, at that instant, a red arm and a hammer hovered backwardly uplifted in the open air, in the act of nailing the flag faster and yet faster to the subsiding spar. A skyhawk that tauntingly had followed the main truck downwards from its natural home among the stars, pecking at the flag, and incommoding Tash Tigo there, this bird now chanced to intercept its broad fluttering wing between the hammer and the wood, and simultaneously feeling that ethereal thrill, the submerged savage beneath, in his death gasp, kept his hammer frozen there, and so the bird of heaven, with archangelic shrieks, 
and his imperial beak thrust upwards, and his whole captive form, folded in the flag of Ahab, went down with his ship, which, like Satan, would not sink to hell till she had dragged a living part of heaven along with her, and helmeted herself with it. Now small fowls flew screaming over the yet yawning gulf, a sullen white surf beat against its steep sides, then all collapsed, and the great shroud of the sea rolled on as it rolled five thousand years ago. Epilogue And I only am escaped alone to tell thee, Job. The drum is done. Why then here does any one step forth, because one did survive the wreck? It so chanced, that after the Parsi's disappearance, I was he whom the fates ordained to take the place of Ahab's bozeman, when that bozeman assumed the vacant post, the same, who, when on the last day the three men were tossed from out of the rocking boat, was dropped astern. So, floating on the margin of the ensuing scene, and in full sight of it, when the half-spent suction of the sunk ship reached me, I was then, but slowly, drawn towards the closing vortex. When I reached it, it had subsided to a creamy pool. Round and round, then, and ever contracting towards the button-like black bubble at the axis of that slowly wheeling circle, like another Ixion I did revolve. Till, gaining that vital center, the black bubble upward burst, and now, liberated by reason of its cunning spring, and, owing to its great buoyancy, rising with great force, the coffin life buoy shot lengthwise from the sea, fell over, and floated by my side. Buoyed up by that coffin, for almost one whole day and night, I floated on a soft and dirge-like mane. The unharming sharks, they glided by as if with padlocks on their mouths, the savage seahawks sailed with sheathed beaks. On the second day, a sail drew near, nearer, and picked me up at last. It was the devious cruising Rachel, that in her retracing search after her missing children, only found another orphan, 